I am about to make a very long video on everything I wish somebody would have told me when I first gave my life to Jesus so that I could understand this book properly because I can almost guarantee you there's a lot of things just about what the Bible is, not the stories in it, but what the Bible is that you're probably misunderstanding as we speak. So I'm going to give you the video right now that I wish somebody would have made me when I very first started studying the Bible and learning about Jesus myself. So without further ado, I want to kind of show you what the curriculum of what we're going to go over is today. And then we're going to dive into these points. Obviously, you can see we're going to go over a lot of things, which is why the video is so long. Everything from what is slash isn't the Bible to understanding the Bible and how it was written uh, and making sure that we're not inserting our own opinions, theology, etc. Why does all of this matter? Versus chapters, books, subtitles, etc. Who are the authors? We're going to go over a lot of things right now. So without going into any more rambling, I want to just jump into it. So first off, what is the Bible? The Bible is a compilation book. It is not a singular book. The Bible is a compilation book of 66 different books by 30 different authors written over a 2000 plus year period. And we do not have any reason to believe that any of these authors really knew much about each other from a personal level. Now, some of them would have known each other, but most of them would have never had any conversation with each other. And a lot of them would not have even known of the other's writings, right? We have the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, and uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And these are called the uh, Torah. And these books were commonly known by people after the Torah was written. But outside of that, there was not a very clear, steady uh, group of passages in the Bible or books that were made in the Bible that were fully known by everybody until a later date. And again, we're going to talk about how the Bible came into fruition and everything like that. So now I want to dive into who are these 66 people and should we trust these, uh, excuse me, who wrote these 66 books and why should we trust these people, right? Well, these are all people who came into the conversation because God had chosen to do life through these people and bring about his promise of Jesus coming and crushing the head of the serpent through these people. And these are just normal people like you and me. These weren't superheroes. These weren't super Christians or anything like this. These are just normal human beings like you and me who God inspired to write these words, right? We see in the book, our letter from Timothy or to Timothy, excuse me, from Paul, that all scripture was written by God through the Holy Spirit and it is profitable for you and me uh, to learn, to train, educate, correct, etc. our lives. And this is kind of the fundamental understanding that is important to note with our scripture readings. So with that said, you know, I was just speaking with somebody the other day and they said, I believe in Jesus and I think he's a dope dude, but I just don't think I buy all of the, you know, words that are in the Bible. And to that, I would say, well, you fundamentally are misunderstanding the Bible then, because if you're going to cherry pick the things that you want out of the Bible, you're completely misunderstanding the purpose and intention in the Bible. Because if you did not know, the original authors of the Bible had a very intentional and specific reason for doing, saying, and writing things the way that they did. And it was not accidental. It was not incorrect. But I also want to clarify a lot of the things that the Bible is not as well. Because there's a lot of, again, misunderstandings that we have about the Bible that I think cause a lot of people a lot of confusion. The first misunderstanding or confusion about the Bible that I want to dispel before we go any further, the Bible is not a history book of all the events that happened in history from creation to the time that Jesus came. Now, although every event that happened in the Bible was historically accurate and historically accurately depicted, does not mean that the book is an exhaustive book of all history, right? Some people will say things like, well, Alexander the Great wasn't mentioned in there. Or some of these massive uh, leaders in China were not mentioned in the Bible. And to that, I would respond, yes, you're right. They were not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, some of these people who people argue are not mentioned in the Bible, but it was never supposed to be a history book of all historical things that happened. The Bible at large is a single book about the man Jesus, God creating everything, and us falling and failing against uh, what God had commanded us to live by. And then the rest of the story is God reconciling us to himself through this man named Jesus who had come from the lineage of all of the people we read through in scripture. Once that happens, it is then godly instruction on how we should live in our Christian lives and then what happens in the afterlife. That, that right there is a really simple one sentence, two sentence summation of what the Bible is. 
and anything that is not important to that storyline is not going to be discussed, right? For example, there were plenty of families that were living outside of the Israelites back then that are never talked about or hardly ever talked about, right? We know some stuff about Canaanites. They played a relatively fair, important role in the Bible. We know some things about Egyptians and things like that. But by and large, that was not the point of the Bible in the first place. So you're not going to be hearing about a lot of those things because again, it was not made to be that. Another misunderstanding is the Bible is not a science book, okay? Again, I'm not saying that all of the scientific uh, statements made in the Bible are false, but it is not a science book. So if you try to put your science goggles on and try to understand the Bible through that lens, you're going to be very confused, right? God is using flawed humans with flawed understandings of a lot of things in life to go and tell his story. And that's not a problem. That's of no concern to us as Christians because we didn't expect them to be perfect for God to be able to use or work through them, right? So yes, these people had some misunderstandings about things like what stars were, uh, the shape of the earth, uh, how certain things worked when it came to... Um, uh, uh, like the weather and things like that. They were not c fully clear on those things, but they didn't try to act like they were experts on those things. They tried to talk about what God had them speak about, which were things all in relation to the creator and how that creator was going to bring us back into reconciliation with himself. So the Bible is not a history book. The Bible is not a science book. The Bible was not made 100% for you, meaning, or rather about you. So the Bible is not a book where every single word that is mentioned in there is in relevance to your life. Let me give you a really good practical example of that. I have nose rings and I have tattoos. And a lot of people will say to me, well, don't you know that the Bible says that you are not supposed to have tattoos? The Bible does not ever say that I'm not supposed to have tattoos or piercings. The Bible tells specific people in a specific context that they're not supposed to. And no, I'm not trying to play some sort of, oh, that was culture or historical game. I think that people kind of try to use that justification to get out of, you know, being able to live in sin more than they should. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you read that passage of scripture, that passage of scripture had nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me. It was not a command towards me or anything like that. That was specifically written in Leviticus, I believe verse 28 or chapter 28, excuse me, about how Jews, I'm not a Jew, were supposed to live in context of living under the old covenant. I am not under the old covenant. Again, we can get into more of that stuff here in a moment. But this is a really good example of how somebody is just going to superimpose their assumptions on the text and put that onto me as if I'm supposed to live by that, right? Here's another example somebody will give. They'll give when Jesus says that he did not come with peace, but he came with a sword to imply or assume that Jesus was inciting violence, that we should start murdering people. Well, if you read that verse out of context, as I just did, yes, you could probably come to the conclusion that Jesus was wanting us to murder people. But if you read it in context, you'll see that is right around the exact same time that Jesus was freely handing himself over to custody uh, so that he could be crucified on a cross, right? If you remember that story well, Jesus, just because of the, the power, glory, or whatever it may have been of Jesus' presence being there, when they tried to take him into custody, they all were knocked onto their butt without Jesus even touching them. And then Jesus freely let them take him. Now, I'm not going to act like I know all the reasons for that specific story, but I think one of them is evidently to show that God, or Jesus in this context, did not have to give himself over. He had the physical capabilities of not being taken over into custody, and he chose to willingly do it anyways. Uh, Paul, or in that same scenario, Jesus tells Peter, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So the point I'm trying to get is if you just read any specific verse, you can try to make any sort of statement that you want out of that verse and try to, again, imply that that has something to do with you or I when it probably actually does not. Which brings me to point number four, which is a misconception. Uh, the Bible is not a bunch of proverbs, nor is it a bunch of fortune cookie verses. Now, people usually laugh when I use that phrase, but I think it's a really important context to get. When you look at a fortune cookie, you will read a single sentence that's like a tweetable mic drop moment for people to potentially live their life by. That's a Chinese proverb. Well, the book of the Bible has the book of Proverbs in it. And this is a lot of one-liners that are mic drop moments. And that's great. And those things are important. And I love all of those things. Just because Proverbs is written that way does not mean the entirety of the Bible is written that way. Uh, again, I can take you to passages um, like in the book of Ecclesiastes where it appears that the author is encouraging, encouraging you and I to get drunk and to be uh, consistently consuming alcohol in an unhealthy way. If you know the book of Ecclesiastes, you would know that that is not the case and you're just taking one single verse out of context. But if you read the Bible to get what you want out of it, then you're always going to be getting things that are wrong out of the Bible. Here's a misconception five of the Bible. that The Bible was not made for you to understand from a 2023 lens. 
We are living in a world where we use certain phrases, certain concepts, certain ideology that if we, uh, we call this eisegesis, where you insert these concepts or these understandings that you currently have about life in the world into the text, you're going to be very confused by some of the meanings of some of these things, right? There are certain things today that seem strange or taboo that were mentioned in Bible times that for you and I are not strange at all or vice versa, that we do certain things today that they would have thought was absolutely crazy back then. Um, so when we hear these kinds of things mentioned, we don't really understand the value or the principle of these things, right? Um, some of these things are like uh, fasting or, or weeping in sackcloth and ashes, people mourning. Uh, for us, when something bad happens in our life, generally we do not make this great event of it where we will sit in the same spot, uh, put ash on our head, wear certain outfits, and live in this kind of somber state for extended periods of time. Um, back then, that was something that was normal, right? Another thing that they would have done back then was they would have ripped their clothes when they were angry. They would have literally just torn their clothing. That's not something that we do nowadays. So things like that, again, in understanding those, those principles or, or having that context in mind helps us understand certain stories. I think a great example of this would be in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Jesus goes to this woman at a well. And there's a lot of emphasis on this story. And if you don't understand the context of the story, a lot of it will not make sense to you. She is at a very specific well. She's at Jacob's well. Why does that matter? Well, because nobody else went to Jacob's well. Why did nobody else go to Jacob's well? Well, there was a division at that point between people called Jews and people called Samaritans. And these people were kind of similar to maybe today how you would see a Christian versus a Mormon. They claim to follow God, but they don't truly follow him. Um, so these people were not generally having a lot of conversations together. They generally butted heads and Jesus went up to this woman and not only did he go up to this woman, but he went up to a Samaritan woman. Not only did he go up to a Samaritan woman, he went up to a Samaritan woman at a well that nobody goes to. It's where outcasts would have went, right? She has to walk an extended period of time, more than likely to be able to get to this well. And Jesus being a man should not have probably been speaking to a woman at that time. It was just all the scenarios that were going on in that context were just odd and strange. And then Jesus says some things that were again, would have been offensive to Jews at the time, but we as Gentiles today, oftentimes without context of that passage or of that story would not have understood it. Uh, he references a story in Deuteronomy of these two mountains, right? The, the mountain of blessing or prosperity and the mountain of curse. Uh, and, and he's explaining uh, this woman has a misunderstanding of, well, is it really on Jacob's well or is it on the other mountain that people are going to be able to really, you know, get to meet God one day? And Jesus makes a statement, you know, um, the true worshipers uh, will not worship me on this mountain or that mountain, but the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. Again, that would have been offensive to Jews. And if you don't understand the context of that Deuteronomy passage, then it might not make a lot of sense to you why this was such a big deal. I could go on and on with different examples of this, where if you're not understanding the intentions of the author of the day, then it will not make a lot of sense to you, right? We, we have to understand, try as best as we can to put our heads and brains in the understanding of the person writing the passage so that we can understand what they were trying to say with what they were saying, not what we think we can get out of what they were trying to say. And that's, I think, one of the biggest mistakes that people make today when they're reading some of these Old Testament passages. Now, point number six that I want to uh, consider as a misunderstanding is that people think that we are supposed to, like, uh, you know, um, Andy Stanley, unhitch from the Old Testament. Although I understand kind of what he's trying to say with this point. Uh, it's, it's false. It is incorrect. And if we do not have a very clear and precise understanding of the Old Testament, the likelihood of our uh, ability to grow and study the scriptures is going to be extremely, extremely challenging. I don't know what uh, passage of the Bible or what translation rather of the Bible that you read out of, but if we pull up an NASB of Matthew chapter, let's say five, you'll see something interesting when um, noticing some of the ways that certain things are structured in this passage. Uh, one of the things is right here. You'll see where it says, all caps, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Why is you shall love your neighbor right here emphasized in all caps where uh, most of the rest of the passage is not? Here's another one that uh, you shall not make a vow to the Lord, right? This is another passage that is, is put in all caps where the rest of it is not. And if you know anything about normal um, uh, English grammar, you would know that uh, here's another uh, explanation of, uh, or example of this happening. You would know in English that that is not proper for you to capitalize an entire sentence. Usually we do that today out of aggression or excitement or anger or something like that. They were not doing that in uh, the NASB specifically here. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're quoting from the Old Testament. Why am I showing you this? It's not to encourage you necessarily to read the NASB, uh, which we'll get to Bible translations at a later point in this study. But it's to explain to you that this is a reference to an Old Testament passage 
that again, if you don't understand the Old Testament passage, this might not make a lot of sense to you, right? So there's a lot of these that happen in the New Testament. I mean, we're talking dozens or hundreds, excuse me, of references to Old Testament scriptures that again, if you don't understand the Old Testament, it's not going to make a lot of sense when you're hearing a New Testament person quote from it, right? By the time that Jesus is on the scene, we had a a much clearer um, compiling of the Old Testament scriptures. So we see them quoting from these Old Testament passages a lot, and they all had a very clear understanding and, and belief in these Old Testament scriptures and understood how they led to Jesus. So if we don't understand these Old Testament scriptures a lot, I mean, I would probably venture to say 20 to 50% of your New Testament is going to make less sense to you than it should be because you should be understanding these Old Testament scriptures. Now, these are just quotes from the Old Testament, direct copied and pasted quotes from specifically the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of Hebrew Old Testament. That's not even to mention all of the examples or scenarios given in the New Testament of Old Testament scripture. Let me give you another example of this. If we look up 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I personally do a lot of my reading of the NASB, we'll see uh, this is about avoiding Israel's mistakes. Well, the importance of this is he is explaining, Paul is explaining to the Corinthians all of the terrible things that happened in the, specifically in the Exodus story. Um, and if you don't understand the Exodus story, again, you're not going to understand why this is being referenced. Now you see some parts that are capitalized, which are again, direct quotes from the Old Testament, but the majority of this passage you see is not quoting at all the Old Testament, but it's still all about the Old Testament. And again, a lot of the New Testament is requoting or referencing back to the Old Testament. So if you don't have a good, clear understanding of your Old Testament scriptures, you're going to have a very, very hard time really being able to study and grow in what it is trying to teach you, right? So that's another one of the things that I want people to grasp when it comes to misconceptions uh, about the Bible. We're going to get to this at a later point uh, more in depth, um, but some people believe that, uh, that you have to listen to a priest or a pastor be able to teach you the scriptures for you to be able to really be a good Christian or, or understand the Bible correctly. This is such a horrible lie for people to believe because so many people do not study the word of God at all because they don't believe that they have the capacity to be able to do it on their own. Now, if you were to take us back a hundred, few hundred years, maybe, I think that there would be more understanding for a statement like this. Uh, maybe even back in Jesus' time where it was common for people to not be as educated or as trained as people specifically in America and first world countries are today. But we have very little excuses in our first world uh, country uh, and world that we live in to be able to make an excuse as to why we can't understand scriptures. Not only is it not that difficult to understand a lot of the Bible. Now, mind you, there are extremely complex passages that I still to this day do not understand and maybe will never understand. But by and large, a lot of the especially New Testament is pretty easy for you to at least get the general context of. Now, no, again, I'm not saying you're going to understand what the Greek word meant here and all of those things. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is to give, believe a lie that you just shouldn't try because it's too hard to understand is just simply not true. Matthew 4, 4 here is again, a quote from the Old Testament, but it says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, And then we look at Psalms 1, it talks about the man who delights in the law of the Lord is going to be like a tree that is firmly planted. When the storms come at him, he is not going to budge because he is firmly planted and delighting in the law of the Lord. We see in Deuteronomy 6 in the Shema that we should be teaching the uh, word as we are standing up, sitting down, walking around. We should have it planted on our doorposts and on our hands and on our foreheads. That we are, there's a very strong emphasis in scripture that we should really know the word of God, right? Um, so it's, it's obviously important for us to do this, but the point I'm getting at with this denial of you need a pastor or priest is to say, you should not be reading or having any sort of private devotion time yourself to the Lord. This can be in devotionals, which I believe are helpful. I encourage people to actually read the actual Bible itself and then see what commentators or other people who are smart and know about the Bible speak about the scriptures itself. Yes, there are going to be passages that you do not understand. Every single day in my Bible studying that I personally do, I look at what other Bible theologians, commentators, etc. have to say on those passages. So again, I don't think that I can figure it all out on myself. I don't believe that. But I have the ability on my own in private to study from these other people so that my only time hearing and learning about scripture is not on a Sunday morning. This is the biggest lie that is deceiving people is that you have to be there on a Sunday morning to learn or you just can't learn. And again, this is so, so explicitly false. And this will leave you down a road of falling into deception more than other people will. 
as well as not understanding all the things that God has for you, which I personally want to understand everything that God has for me. Another one of the things that I'll get to in a little bit of a later point is the Bible was not written in chapters, verses, and titled. The book of Genesis was never called Genesis. Um, There were no verses and chapters. And again, I'm going to get to this at a later point. I'm not going to go in depth on it right now. But the reason that this is important as a misconception is this allows people to live in that uh, fortune cookie verse mentality that I was discussing earlier. I do not want you to live in this fortune cookie verse mentality because it will get you very confused when you're reading certain passages and you, honest to God, believe that something is the way that it's said to be because everybody has, you know, always quoted it that way in the past or whatever, again, out of context. Which will lead me to the final point that I make on misconceptions and then we'll move on to our next point. It is important that you understand that just because you've heard something about the Bible your whole life does not make it true. For a a, a short story about my life, I grew up in a more Baptist, more um, Reformed type church. And then when I turned 12, 13-ish, I started going to a charismatic, holy rolling type church. I'm not criticizing either of them, but I heard a very, very different version of the gospel and different emphases on those two gospels at the two places that I went. Now, I I heard at one place uh, more of, you know, less of the gifts of the spirit, more on being focused on serving and and caring for your neighbor as yourself, which is awesome. And the next I heard, you know, a lot of this had to do with your private devotion time, your speaking in tongues, your intimacy with the Lord and living more in in purity and holiness and very little about actually serving your neighbor, preaching the gospel, etc. And and through those things, I heard different beliefs on whether it was Calvinism versus Arminianism, or we could go down a plethora of different topics that are oftentimes secondary issues that I just assumed one of them to be true because that's what I'd heard. And in growing up, I'd found out, wow, like these are flawed people. And and actually one of the groups had it wrong. So the reason it's important for you to study scriptures on your own is so that you know what God is teaching for yourself, not hoping that somebody else taught these things to you the right way. So uh, anyways, the Bible is written by 30 plus people, but it was all the words of God that he wanted to have written in here. Now, a quick apologetic I'll say is, If we believe that a creator could create everything, which if you are a Christian, you do believe that, then to assume or to believe then that he could also write a book of, you know, a handful of pages and have all the appropriate and correct and accurate words in those pages and to have uh, the people not make any mistakes in those pages and have all the right books of those, you know, compiled together properly is not that challenging of a belief to have. If you believe that a creator could have created everything, created math, created physics, created science, created gravity, created uh, all of the molecules in your body and atoms and everything working properly and the fine tuning of the universe and created us to be able to have eyes that can see and taste buds that can taste and animals and birds and trees. If he could do all of that for him to just put a book together in the right order, like, isn't that a way smaller miracle than him creating the entirety of the world? If you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later so that you could be saved from your sins, don't you think writing a book the right way would be the least of your concerns? So even to my friend the other day who said that he believes in Jesus, but he doesn't know if he necessarily believes in all of the crazy stories in the Bible, to him I would respond, I hear what you're saying, but how do you believe that God could create everything, which is, again, I would say believe that would be the greatest miracle ever, but you do not believe that he would be able to have all of the stories that he has referenced in his book actually accurately replaced or placed, excuse me. I think that would be a very strange belief to have. I I don't understand any sort of intellectual consistency with that. So I think it's important that we start from the frame that this is God's word, that every word in here is correct. Every word in here is accurate and that we have the right book with all of the right words in it. Right. Uh, And I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the creation of the Bible and and how we got the Bible that we have today. But I want to talk about what books are not canonical, which means the real word of God. Um, First off, I, I, you know, we're going to talk about translations later, but the, the quick TLDR is I do not care what translation of the Bible you read as long as you're reading one. Okay, Uh, there are a handful of exceptions to that that I think are very, very bad. The Passion Translation is one of those. The Message is one of those. Uh, The NIV, I would strongly discourage. The New World Translation is not a translation at all. Um, So there are a handful that I think are strongly should be discouraged. Uh, But if as long as it's not one of the ones I just mentioned, which most people who would be watching this video in the first place would not even be familiar with the ones that I just referenced other than the NIV, then cool, just read any of them. Even if you read the NIV, I know plenty of people who exclusively read the NIV and will be in heaven one day. Amen. Praise God. So again, not that big of a deal. But there are a few that should be really concerning. One is uh, is what Roman Catholics read, which is called the Apocryphal Writings. In the Old Testament, they have, uh, I don't remember the exact number, it's 12, 13-ish books that we do not have in our Old Testament. 
first and second Mac- Maccabees, uh, Ecclesi- uh, Ecclesiastes. Um, I feel like I'm saying that, that name wrong, but, um, there's a handful of others like this that are not found in our Bible that we read today that we should not be reading because again, they are not canonical. One of the ones I always get questions about, which is not even in the apocryphal writings is the book of Enoch. Again, also not canonical. It is quoted in Jude. So obviously it's something that you can read and and observe and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't believe at all, but it does not make it scripture. Here are a few others that are not scriptural is uh, external writings by different cultish groups. So Mormons uh, read uh, the book of Mormon which is Joseph Smith's writings. That is not scriptural. That is not biblical. He is a false teacher. Again, I'm not trying to get controversial necessarily or attack anybody, but I want to make sure that people are not reading that because that will lead you into deception. A really short example would be 2 Nephi 25, 23. says, it is by grace that you are saved after all that you can do, which is in complete contradiction to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not of your own works, lest any man should boast, but it is a free gift of God unto salvation. So please do not read that book. Uh, They also have their Pearls of Great Price, Articles of Faith. Um, We have the Vatican um, that Catholics will read, and they will take that to the same uh, uh, focus or value as the biblical writings, which is, again, also incorrect. And then the only other one that I can think of uh, off of hand is different um, groups. Again, Catholics would, some, some groups of Catholics would be one of these. They believe that any sort of early church writings like the Didache, some people argue on how to say that, but the, the Didache would be another one of those, which is the disciples of the early apostles. So people like John, Peter, Paul, James, etc. The, their disciples, the people that were discipled by those people had made writings, again, like in the Didache. And people will see those as equally as much scripturally uh, valuable, which is, again, not true. And another one is not scriptural per se, but is tradition of man. Right Again, Catholics would fall into this category as well, but people who believe that the traditions that they had followed all their life growing up could also be just as doctrinally or as um, eternally as important as, uh, in this case, you know, doing, reading the Bible itself, which is not true. This right here, uh, you know, the reformed old people are going to say it's sola scriptura, scripture alone. Um, and that would be accurate, not because reformed people say it, but because the Bible says that this is the only place that we should be finding capital T truth from. So anyways, we've gotten an overview of what the Bible is, what it is, what it is not. Again, uh, the most important thing for you to understand is this one book, uh, as the Bible project says, that is one unified story leading us to Jesus. Everything about this book is going to have some aspect or some context of trying to revert you back to the Jesus story. Everything in this book is for the intention of you understanding about a king that is going to come. Now, every specific detail is not about Jesus. You know, some people think that every tree and bird and and earth reference is all Jesus. That's not true. But everything is in relation or trying to point you back to the Jesus story. So even if a detail might seem minute or unimportant, it still all has to do with the uh, Jesus story. So now... um, you know, we've talked about uh, theology, understanding, um, and and now I want to explain the original language because I think this is another aspect that people might misunderstand. We have uh, three languages that the Bible was written in. It was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. The Old Testament was Hebrew predominantly, some Aramaic. The New Testament is Greek predominantly, and again, some Aramaic. The reason this is important is understanding that when we talk in the uh, a moment about the translations, the different translations that you can read, understand that unless you are reading Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, you are not reading the official, official Bible, right? That's not a problem. Uh, we have some really great translators who have translated into hundreds of different translations for you to be able to check out. Um, so again, it's not that big of a deal at the end of the day. Um, but if you want the actual, actual, official, real translation of the Bible, you need to have it in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. We have those uh, manuscripts still, which means copies of the original documents, which are really important, really valuable, and we should um, be appreciative of those things. But you do not have to read those to have a proper understanding. The reason I bring this up is because Muslims will tell you that you uh, have to read the Quran in uh, Arabic to be able to truly understand it. And anybody else just can't understand it. So they will not tell you that until you start to try to jab at the Quran. Like if I were to just go up to a Muslim right now and say, hey, I only speak English. Can I still go to heaven one day and understand the Quran properly? They'll say 100%. If I say, well, what about this specific passage that contradicts, uh, you know, what the Quran teaches versus what the Bible teaches? They'll say, well, you don't speak Arabic, so you wouldn't understand. Um, So again, we don't want to play that game because that's not true. You will get the clearest understanding of any writings ever in its original language, right? But with that being said, uh, you can understand the Bible perfectly fine spend eternity in heaven just fine you can look up uh, translations of greek words into the original language hebrew words in the original language with things like strong's concordances lexicons and otherwise so 
we are okay, but I do want you to understand that it was not written in those languages uh, originally. Now let's talk about the uh, uh, wh wh why all this matters. Why does it matter to say all these things that I've said up to this point? Well, first off, it matters because it, it's important for you to understand clearly what the Bible is teaching itself. If you don't understand what the Bible is and what the intention of it is, you're going to try to use the Bible for reasons that were not intended by the original authors. Let me give you, again, maybe a controversial example, but I just want to prove a point. The Bible never, ever, there's not a single verse in this book that has any intention on trying to show you the age of the earth. We talked earlier about science, right? And I'm going to lose probably 50% of you right now, and that's okay. The Bible, if you just look at the Bible and you don't look at answers in Genesis or any other sort of, if you just look at what the Bible teaches, never is it trying to give you answers on the age of the earth. Can we imply the age of the earth? Sure, you can make your argument on why you believe the age of the earth is a certain way. But when you try to make the Bible into something it's not, you start getting really, really, really confused, really, really messed up. People will use this for political agendas and say, this is why you should be Republican. This is why you should be Democrat. And when you start doing that, you're not taking the Bible for what its intentional or intentions are, right? Uh, I've seen people try to argue why um, the Bible encourages communism or socialism um, or, or, or democracy. And, and again, although there are passages, different passages that are seem very uh, democratic in nature, uh, others seem very capitalistic in nature, some seem socialistic in nature. Although that is the case, the point of this book is not that purpose. So when you try to make the book into that, what it is not, you are doing the book a disservice and you're not doing what the original authors had intended by the writings, or more importantly, if it's more blatant, what God meant from this book. This is supposed to give you uh, 2 Peter 3.1. This book is made to give you everything that you need pertaining to life and godliness. And in that is not polit politics or science in the age of the earth or carbon dating or any of those things. Now, I want to clarify what I did not just say is that I believe that we should all be uh, uh, liberal atheists who believe that the earth is billions of years old and ignore all things that people have fought for, for for years in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that when you try to start making the book into that, you are not doing what the intention of the book is. It also matters to the point that I said about the Bible actually being 100% correct, because if we cannot agree that God was able to put the right words in his book, then we are going to be arguing for ages when it comes to any topic that we personally feel like disagreeing with, right? Uh, there are progressive Christians in a very large progressive Christian movement right now who are trying to say that the Bible is not actually inerrant, that Jesus was like a sick, nasty, dope hippie dude uh, who had some great vibes and uh, things that we can, you know, understand and grow and learn from, but it was not actually capital T truth. They actually don't even believe there's such thing as capital T truth. If you've never seen these kind of progressive movements, uh, you should probably stay away from them because they're horribly toxic anyways. Um, but it's really important because now you can start dismantling or rejecting any sort of sin in your life and say it's actually not sin anymore because the Bible is actually not in error. The Bible is actually not God's word. So let me give you an example of some of these. There is a gentleman named Brandon Roberts, sin Roberts or Robertson, I forget. And he believes that homosexuality is not a sin. Again, not trying to get controversial. I'm just trying to give you some good examples. He believes that uh, that it is not a sin. And if you were to bring up popular passages like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 or Romans 1 that very clearly express homosexuality as a sin, he will then just skirt off to saying, well, I just don't believe that the whole Bible was God breathed. If you say something else about homosexuality, I watched a video of his a few weeks ago where he said, did you know that Jesus was encouraging one of his friends to come out? And then he references the Lazarus story. He was dead in a tomb and he tells him to come out of the tomb and into life. And he tries to use that as an analogy or a metaphor for people coming out of the closet. Again, you are inserting all of your 2020 uh, decade uh, understanding of God or the Bible or scripture uh, or, or of life or more so your sexual sins and desires and trying to superimpose that into the Bible so that it can fit with the agenda that you were already wanting to live with. If we do this, this is very dangerous. This is why we have to understand that God's word alone is correct, although every other man be a liar, like it says in Romans. I'm going to trust God's word above everybody else. If that makes everybody else a liar but God, I'm still going to trust God at the end of the day. Galatians 1 tells us that if anybody preaches a different gospel than what we preach, even if an angel comes to you with a different message than the gospel that Paul preached, to reject it, right? We see in 2 Corinthians that uh, people are going to come and preach a different Jesus than what was preached by the early church, by the apostles, 
by Jesus. And if they are preaching a different Jesus, that you reject that person's gospel because it is a false gospel, right? That is why it's so important that we start from this book and grow and move up from this being our foundation. The word of God is the foundation. Everything is built upon that foundation, foundation being Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the word. Vitally important that we start with the Bible being true. Uh, and again, I understand Noah's Ark. I don't understand it. Maybe uh, Jonah and the whale. I don't understand it. How about all these uh, crazy, you know, wars or other stories that seem miraculous, talking snakes, etc. Your lack of understanding or your inability to comprehend fully what is happening in a Bible story does not just give you the liberty to automatically reject it. Because what you're saying is you are smarter than God and that your ways are greater than his ways and your understanding is greater than his understanding. First Corinthians encourages us to become foolish so that we can actually become wise. That those professing to be wise in this age are actually the real fools. People who are too intellectual and too smart to be able to have faith in the words of the Bible, that those people will never actually receive or see the kingdom itself. That we need to understand, yes, a lot of these stories are crazy and miraculous because that's God by nature is doing miraculous, crazy things. So I don't just reject something because I don't understand it or agree with it. I need to understand I have my own personal feelings, desires, interests, etc. And if they are counter to Jesus in any capacity, which they will be at times, I need to reject what I believe, not reject the Bible itself. He is ultimate truth. I need to subject everything I believe under his truth. Isaiah tells us, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Just as the seas are from the heavens are his ways from our ways. So we need to humble ourselves, understand that we are not God. He is God. And we are going to trust what he says, not what we say. So hopefully, hopefully I made that clear, but this is why this matters that we understand all of these things. And again, it's understand that we important that we understand the verses and, uh, and chapters not being in there so that we don't try to create an agenda out of the Bible that the Bible was not intentionally trying to do. So now let's talk about these chapters and verses and titles and the importance of them and why they were not in the original text. Well, first off, you know, let's just take it to the New Testament. I think this is the easiest place to go. When we look at a letter written to the Romans, right? And we see in there, um, I know it's going to be blurry on your screen because it's not focused up on you. But um, when we see all these words, we see verses next to them in chapters. And then oftentimes we see subtitles. I'm not sure if in my little Bible here, this is a really small full-size Bible. Yeah, it looks like it does have the passages still uh, in the chapters. Uh, right here in chapter nine, it says solitude for Israel. Why is it important to know that these were not actually in there? And why were they in there in the first place? Well, they were added at a later date. Paul did not do this because remember, he's writing to the church in Rome and he's just writing a letter to them. So imagine writing a love letter to your wife. You're not going to like, like, you know, reference specific passages or quote or, or document it in a certain process. You're just going to write your heart to her. And the same way he was writing his heart to the Romans and training them and teaching them, right? So why do we have them in here if the original authors did not put them in there, right? Uh, doesn't scripture say in Revelation to not add a jot or a tittle to the word? Uh, yeah, it does. And no one's adding anything to the word. You're adding context or structure for people to be able to find things easier, right? Back in the day, if they would have said, hey, let's turn in the scroll of Isaiah, if you didn't know where the passage was or where he was starting from because you didn't know the word that well, and if you're a 2020 you know, type Christian, you probably don't know the word that well, frankly, like they would have back then, uh, then you have no idea where to read along with him. Not that they would have been reading along. They didn't have their own, you know, their own um, copies of the Bible back then anyways, but it would have been very hard for you to follow along with somebody else. This has been given help to give us context so that we can find places in the Bible very quickly and efficiently and just jump to those spots, right? Again, they're not supposed to be trying to intentionally promote or uh, push a certain agenda. They're simply there to be able to help give context of what's happening so that you can understand where it is in its writing, right? So again, chapters, verses, subtitles were not there. The reason I think subtitles is important is because sometimes the subtitles are really, really good, you know, uh, you know, really properly nailing what that passage is about. Other times, I don't think it does as great of a job. Let me give you an example of a passage. Luke 15 is the story of the prodigal son, right? Uh, I, I don't have anything wrong with that. I'm not trying to be terribly nitpicky here, but the emphasis on the story of the prodigal son is not supposed to be on the son, but rather of the love and forgiveness of the father. So maybe a more proper title for that passage would be something in context of the love of the father, not the crap uh, of the son himself, right? Again, is it, is it giving you a deceived understanding? No, it's not. Again, I don't believe any of these have some sort of demonic or manipulative agenda, but it is important to note that they were not originally in there. So when you're reading these things, it is just valuable to read them without it or without that understanding of it so that it doesn't sometimes maybe sway what you're trying to get out of the passage. Let me give you another example of where verses um, specifically can be of danger to have in your Bible. Uh, when I'm reading... Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter two. 
uh, I will actually stop reading out of this and I will pull it up on the screen so that you can follow along with me. Um, but let's go to Ephesians chapter two. That's not where I wanted to go. I'm so sorry. This book is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. It says, and you were dead in your offenses and sins. If I were to just keep going, you probably wouldn't think anything of it. Here's why this is important. That word and uh, is a connecting word. In context of what you just read, I'm going to add upon what I just said by saying that you were dead in your offenses and sins. Well, that poses a problem if you don't know what it's saying that in reference to or what it's connecting. Well, that's one of the potential uh, damages that can come from you reading things out of context or reading things at the beginning of a chapter or a verse. You don't know what I was just saying it was in context of. Let me give you an even clearer example. Let's just go two chapters over. Or here's another great one before I even go to chapter four. It says, for this reason, I, Paul, preserves, you know, for what reason? If you don't know the reasoning, you can't, like, nobody could start this book uh, or this chapter starting in Ephesians chapter three, verse one. You cannot do that with a good conscience, knowing that it was just saying all of this stuff in Ephesians 2 for this reason. For what reason? You don't know the reason if you don't know what Ephesians 2 is about. Let's go to uh, chapter 4. This happens a lot in the Bible as well. Therefore, therefore what? Like, therefore is there for a certain reason. If you don't know what it's there for, then you're going to be rather confused. It says, therefore, meaning in context of everything that we just read, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you've been called. Well, you really better know what it's there for to be able to get really good context. Again, this is just one of those things that is very important for us to at least keep in the back of our mind in our reading. It doesn't mean you're sinning if you start at chapter three or start on chapter four. But I would just want to flip back for a second and be like, wait, well, what was exactly going on there that I may not have understood before? So that's another one of those things that um, might be beneficial. Now let's break down some more things that you might see in your uh, Bibles. You'll see different things maybe in a digital format than a, a paper format. But you'll see these like little, uh, you know, like these little asterisks here. Like this says, see, it's, you know, it's, it's telling you that there's something to, to understand or to be quoted down here for you to maybe understand in better context. So let's go to the first one here. Um, it's, it says, uh, let's go to the second one. This will be easier. It says, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also has descended into the lower parts of the earth. It says, what does, and there's, there's a little B next to does. Well, if we go to the very bottom, it'll tell us what that was for. It says that the word, that, that, that asterisk B there literally means it, uh, uh, is it accept? So right here, when we go back here, you can read it more like, is it accept for point B, excuse me, it's right here. Um, so that you understand that, you know, there might be a more literal understanding of this passage that you may have not understood before. So that's another important passage or point for you to understand here. Here's another extremely important aspect that we have in English that they did not have in Greek. Punctuation. If I said, I'm angry, you know that there would probably be an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence. If I said, um, let's say, I was going to talk and ramble for uh, three paragraphs long, you would be able to know when I was trying to stop my last sentence and then starting my new sentence by and large. Well, remember, the Bible was not written in your English language, so that was not always very clear in the New Testament in all of the writings. Now, 99% of the time, it was, but a great example would be Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. There are actually debates on when sentences would even start and end in this passage. Now, I'm not going to go through them all right now because um, the point is not for that, but here's one example of this. We go, I'm just going to start part of the way through verse 12 here. It says, to the end that who, uh, that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be the praise of his glory, period. In him, you also have this, and then it goes on. There are other translations of the Bible who actually have in him as the end of this sentence and the periods after the word him. So it says Christ would be the praise of his glory in him, period. You also, after, you see my point? Both make sense. Both would actually work perfectly fine, but that's a debate over where the punctuation ought to have had gone there. Now, does it change the fundamental principle or meaning of that passage at all? No, absolutely not. So that's why it's really not a big deal at the end of the day, but it's important to understand that any period, exclamation mark, comma, parentheses, um, there was just parentheses here as well. It was in, a, it was in uh, chapter four. Let me go back to chapter four so I can show you that. This is another example of right here where you see the parentheses. Uh, this was never in the original uh, text itself. But you can see the parentheses are here and they're trying to, again, let you know that we believe or are assuming that that was something that was supposed to be in parentheses, right? 
And again, I'd already mentioned this one earlier, but this right here will have in all capitalization in the NASB. This passage that is a direct quote from the Old Testament. And another thing the NASB will do, and some other translations will do this as well, is you see that this word right here is an asterisk, right? Why is this specific word an asterisk? And actually, if you read throughout the entirety of the rest of uh, the NASB, you will see other words that are also like the word is right here, or that is, is also an asterisk. Well, there were certain words, um, generally, again, conjoining words similar to the word and, but, or, it, is, etc., that were not actually ever words in Greek at all. So if you were to literally word for word translate a, a Greek word or a Greek sentence into English, there might be 10 words in English and there would only be five words in Greek because they just didn't have some of those smaller be, but, and, or type words, a, uh, it in their language. So we have to, like, we can very clearly assume or imply that they, this is how it would be translated into the English language. So whenever you see those asterisks, that is simply just to let you know that this the word the was literally never there, but he led captive captives doesn't make a lot of sense in English. So they add those words in there to make the whole sentence make more sense and flow. And by the way, we'll get into the different uh, translations and translation types. There's types of translations, not only just translations, but there are different translation types that we'll go over as well. Um, but yeah, I just want to, people to understand that. Another example would be, you see how this is indented right here. This whole passage right there is indented. Well, why is that indented? Matter of fact, actually, if you go to a lot of the Bible, you'll see that a lot of the Bible has a lot of indentations, right? Uh, Genesis chapter one would be a great example. And it looks like I don't know how to spell Genesis. There we go. And again, the paragraphs here. These are things that were never in the original text, but it's something that we have in our text today. Let's go to uh, Psalms 1. Um, again, we see that there's a very, very methodical structure to the Psalms here, right? Uh, we also see, when we look at some of uh, Paul's writings in the New Testament, there's also parts that are indented where he goes into poetry. And generally when a poetry uh, uh, or a song is added into the scriptures, it will indent that to let you know that it's a change of literary type. Um, so again, it was never put there in the original language, but it's important for us to be able to see so that we can distinguish those things. Another thing, I think this one's probably more so common sense, but oftentimes when we look at our New Testament, uh, if I go back to Matthew chapter five here, we'll just go to chapter seven to mix it up a little bit. Jesus is speaking right here. It says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. Uh, in a lot of translations, this will be red letters, okay? Uh, why would it be red letters? Again, it would be red letters just to let you know the indication of Jesus speaking. Um, in certain NASB translations, older NASB translations, uh, you'll see that God always spoke in Old English. Why? I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was just a, a distinguishing from God speaking versus other people speaking. Because sometimes when you go in like the prophet books and things like that, you're not exactly sure who's talking right now. Is it the prophet on behalf of God? Is it actually God speaking right now? So they would do that. Uh, some translations will actually capitalize whenever God speaks in the Old Testament so that you knew that it was Yahweh and it was not just some other person speaking. Again, just for clarity's sake. Are these things damaging to the text? Nine times out of 10, they're not. They're actually helping you understand the passage better. But I think it's also important that we understand these things in our readings just so that we can see some potential nuances that can be there. All right, how about the order of the Bible? How did we get the structure and the order of the Bible that we have today? Well, um, the Bible was not written uh, in chronological order, which I think is one of the really important things to understand about the Bible. Let's look up a picture of the books of the Bible. When we look here, uh, again, there's 66 books in a proper Bible. And I think this is actually a really cool uh, little picture here. I've never seen this before, but I think it's beneficial to see. Uh, the Old Testament has the first five, uh, which are structured in their specific place. Again, these are called um, the Tanakh. Um, then we have uh, these books, which are the story books of the Bible. This is Joshua, Judges, Ruth, etc. Then we have the wisdom literature here. And this is going to be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon. And then we have the major prophets, the minor prophets. Uh, and then we have the New Testament, right? And that's, again, broken up into the Gospels, the Book of Acts, uh, the Epistles. And then we have the... Um, the later epistles and then the, the book of Revelation is generally uh, separated on its own. This uh, specific picture does not have it that way, but that's okay. Um, again, not a hill to die on. But I think the important, important aspect to understand is, again, first off, this is not chronological. Genesis did not happen and then Exodus and Leviticus, then Numbers and Deuteronomy, then Joshua, then Judges, then Ruth, then First Samuel. That's not how it worked. Um, the reason it's important is, is a lot of Genesis actually is chronological, by the way. And these first few books were more than likely chronological as well. 
But when it comes to the person who wrote the book and the time that they wrote the book, that is not necessarily the case. Um, that it, like, like the Genesis was not necessarily the first book written. There's a lot of people who would argue Job is probably the first book written. doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, but I just want you to understand the differences here. Uh, these were the first five books. Uh, nobody debates that these are the first five books. People will then argue the rest of the order of the Old Testament. Again, it really does not matter how you read them. There are Bibles that you can actually buy that will structure the Bible in its chronological order, which I think is awesome. Um, I'm not, not sure exactly how much benefit that will necessarily be to you, but it is important to know that you can read it in a chronological order. Another really uh, good uh, image that I've seen a lot uh, is the timeline um, graph of the Bible. And it will show you, uh, I think especially what's really cool here is showing you the different kings uh, that were uh, living and, and ruling during what prophets were there as well. Now, this is a very, very deep one. Uh, I'm not going to obviously go through the whole thing right now because it's not going to be super beneficial, I don't think, for you to be able to read through. But it shows you who was doing what at what times, and it will give you like the general time and, uh, and date of when these things were happening. So again, these things can be really, really beneficial for you to see so that you can say, oh, like, oh, now I see that, that Malachi uh, or Micah was alive or doing whatever during this time frame, right? Um, but so I think that these things can be really beneficial for you to read, but again, not something to, you know, put your entire life on, but you know, the partnering of the kingdom, creation story, perishing the fall, uh, the promise of the kingdom. Again, different people will have these structured in different ways, but it's just showing you the different timeline and the different stories that were happening during the times of the Bible. But yeah, the point of this is just to see different things were happening during different times of the Bible. And I don't think any of those things are necessarily, again, a hell per se worth dying over, but the old Testament was written in this order um, because it's very easy. It's easiest, I believe, to read through. Again, major prophets. One of the biggest common misunderstandings about this is that these are the important prophets and these are the unimportant prophets because these are the major, those are the minor. Uh, it's just in reference to the size of the books. These were the major, they were the big books, right? These all have 20 plus chapters in them or so other than Daniel. Uh, and then all of these have less chapters in the book. That's literally all, all it has to do with. And then uh, that makes up the Old Testament. And again, if you're wondering what the Old Testament means, uh, Old Testament is generally synonymous with Old Covenant. This was God's Old Covenant that he had with man. Um, and, and again, that story of after the creation and fall story, that this is like the reconciliation or God's attempt to reconcile and seeing that God keeps making covenants and promises with his people and they keep failing over and over and over and over again. And then the New Testament or the New Covenant is God creating a, uh, a new agreement with his people on how we will live on earth in relation to God from that point on. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, again, not in chronological order. Uh, and then we have Acts, which is going to be in chronological order after those books. And then we're going to have the, uh, the, the letters. And then again, the end times heaven kind of conversation, right? Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, all of these books are not chat or are not written with a title to them. We title them. Most of them are rather common sense, right? Matthew was written because Matthew was the author. Mark was written or titled that way because Mark was the author, etc. Acts is in regards to Acts of the Holy Spirit or Acts of the Apostles. Some people will debate what, you know, the official Acts of what is. Um, and then again, all of these were simply the locations that they were writing to or the people he was writing to. Romans, Romans really through Thessalonians is just the locations he was writing to, the churches he was writing to. And then Timothy's were to Timothy himself. Titus was to Titus himself. Philemon was to Philemon himself. Um, and then again, same with these. Uh, this was written to the church of Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew church. Uh, James wrote this, Peter wrote those, John wrote those, Jude wrote that one, and then Revelation was written by John uh, about, again, the revelation of the end times. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but in the Old Testament, Genesis literally just means creation, Exodus means to leave, um, Leviticus is about the, the Levitical tribe and those laws that were given, uh, Numbers was in regards to the numbering of the people, and then Deuteronomy was in regards to the end. Uh, so you can go through all those and look up at a later date the purpose of all of the different you know names of those books. But again, not something to be concerned about. Some people, again, they want to be like super like, you know, argumentative and be like, well, I'm not going to use any of those names. Cool. You don't have to use any of those names. Uh, you can go down a very long track with that. But again, it's not that big of a deal at the end of the day, whether you call them by their names or not. God did not write those names on those. So those were not officially ordained by God. Just kind of helpful, I believe, to understand, um, you know, the reasoning for those. Okay, let's now talk about how we got all of the specific books that we have in our current today time Bible. A lot of people will tell you that we had these councils, specifically the Council of Nicaea. And the Council of Nicaea is where all the manipulation and demonic things happen. Well, it depends on what side of the camp you're on, I guess. And this is where we trick people, deceive people, etc., in regards to how the Bible or whatever was created. Um, I think Tim, Tim Mackey has, uh, it's not on the Bible Project's um, uh, YouTube channel. It's just a Tim Mackey thing. But he goes on a very deep dive. I think it's like two, two and a half hours 
on how we got our Bible, specifically our New Testament. It was a very, very organic process, okay? Uh, first off, the Gospels were written by the Gospel, uh, the, the, the eyewitnesses or the eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses. Um, so that, that was pretty straightforward. I don't think there's a whole lot of, there's not as much at least debate about those ones. Now, when we get to the letters and things like that, that's where it's like, well, why did this one get in and this one not get in? For example, Paul mentions, I believe it's the end of, it's either Romans or Ephesians, the letter to the Laodiceans. So Paul evidently seemed to have written a letter to the Laodiceans. Some theologians will argue that was actually the letter, uh, the, the uh, letter uh, to uh, uh, Ephesus. And that he was referring to that letter that we already have. And then others will argue that it was a letter that was not put in our Bible, but it was a letter written to another church. I don't see why either of those would be concerning views to have. Both of them seem fine. doesn't really matter which one you believe on that. But I think the point at the end of the day that's important to note is the way that we have our Bible today in general is because somebody wrote an original letter or book or poetry writing, and then other people copied that down, right? So Paul wrote a letter to the Church of Rome, and they handed it, so they got you know mailed over, right, to the Church of Rome. Now the Roman church has it and the elders of that church would have then read it all together and then presented that to their church congregation. They would have said, hey, Paul just wrote us in. Here's what he said. They would have read through all of what we now have as 16 chapters. And after that was done, they would have all said, hey, can I get a copy of that? So they didn't take it to the printer. The fax machine was not working in those days. It was out of order. Uh, it was a joke, by the way. Um, it, there's no such thing back then, obviously, right? They didn't have a pr printing press. Johann Gutenberg wasn't around yet. So they would have handwritten down the letter to the Church of Rome. And then what they would have done is somebody else from the Church of Laodicea, from Ephesus, from Corinth, etc., would have said, hey, we want to know what Paul wrote to you guys as well. So they would have, again, copied that down. And then they would have taken that to their church and read it to their church. And they would have all written their copies of that letter of Rome. And Ephesians was like, no way, Church of Corinth. Paul wrote you too. Please send us the writing that he wrote you as well. So they would say, oh, okay, great. Well, let's get that. And then they would have written that down. The very organic process of writing down the letters and copying the original letter that was written by whoever uh, was writing, whether it was Paul or James um, or John or et cetera. And then now everybody has practically the exact same Bible way before these councils ever took place, okay? So they already had a stack of all of the same Bible for the most part. Yes, there were some outliers, but same goes with understanding how manuscripts work in general, right? One of the common apologetic debates against the Bible is how can you trust the Bible when you don't have any of the original writings themselves, which is true. You cannot find the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. Some people go, oh my gosh, well, how do I know that we have the right thing? Well, it's actually an opposite concern. We should have a concern if we only had the original. Why? Because you could make the original say whatever you wanted it to say and nobody would be able to fact check you, right? But if we have hundreds or really actually thousands of trans uh, of manuscripts of these original letters, then it's very easy to know if somebody was making it up, right? If, let's get really practical for a, a second, if 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 says that homosexuality is a sin, and one, you know, 300 letters said that, and one of the letters or two of the letters said it's not a sin, you're going to know what the outliers are and go, well, this is really, really obvious. Everybody's saying the same thing other than you. So we know that you're the one that's lying about it. So actually having these, these uh, manuscripts is actually more proof of uh, the validity of these texts than a, a kind of a denial of it or, or of a criticism of it, right? So it's more beneficial that we do not have the original manuscripts. It actually helps our case as Christians in believing these words. But the emphasis I want to get at with you is the fact that they were all very organically, people were getting the exact same books in their Bible, right? Again, there were certain arguments over like uh, specifically the book of James, um, specifically the book of Revelation. There seemed to be some sort of historical accounts of arguments on whether those were canonical or not. But at the end of the day, we seem to be pretty clear, pretty confident that these were all things that were supposed to be in our Bible and we have that. And again, Let's look at it macro again for a second. If God is able to create everything that he was able to create, uh, birds, trees, moons, stars, gravity, eyesight, taste, vision, etc., then putting all the right books together would have been a very easy, simple process, right? If we had one man who was deciding all the books in the Bible and their order and everything, that would have been much more concerning, but that's not how it went. So we have very little concern about those things. And also, by the way, if these people at the Council of Nicaea per se were trying to hide the things that they did not want in the Bible, what would they have done? They would have not only just said, we don't want them in the Bible, they would have burned all the books. Because even back then, it would have not been uncommon for people to read things like the Didache, which again, were the writings of the apostles' students. 
they would have just burned these things. They would have told people that if you, you know, read these things or use these things, they would have burned them all at the stake, burned all the books at the stake, and we wouldn't even have them today. But they obviously did not do that because that was not the, this elite group of Illuminati members who were, guys, that's goofy. That's not what they were trying to do because, again, they kept them so that you can still read them. If you want to read the Book of Enoch, you can. If you want to read the Apocryphal Writings, you can. If you want to read the Emphasy Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, etc., you can read these. They're false. They're almost 100% unanimously agreed that they're false as well and not actually canonical. But you can read them. So, again, if we were really trying to hide them, we would have not let anybody see them in the first place. But it seemed rather evident that these things were not actually true scripture anyways. So, when it comes to the books that we got, very organic process. I just gave you the TLDR version of that. Again, if you want to watch an hour and a half deep dive on this topic by Tim Mackey, who can explain it way better and way more in depth than me, please check out that video. Awesome. Now let's talk about the types of translations that are out there. There are three types of translations. There's bunches of translations, but there's like groups for the translations. The first is called word for word translations. This is where we take the words from Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic and directly translate that word for word into English. That is what a handful of different uh, ASV, NASB, I believe RSV is in that category as well. Uh, I personally read an NASB. That is my daily reader, right? That is what this Bible right here is. This is what I read on a daily basis. New American Standard Bible. This is a direct translation from Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic into English. There are pros and cons of all of these, by the way. The pro of this is you have no concern whether you're getting the actual exact word for word thing that was being said when you're reading the English version of that. That's one of the pros of this. One of the cons of this is that you're not necessarily going to get the clearest meaning from it because it could be so wordy that you might not even actually understand what's being said. Let me give you an example from the book of Ephesians again on this happening, right? We're going to read in the NASB, uh, Ephesians chapter one, a part of it, and I'm going to prove to you the wordiness of this that could be much clearly or much simp more simply stated in a different translation, right? So let me zoom in on this and it says, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and part of the reason for this is, again, we do not have uh, proper uh, punctuation in Greek language, so it's, it can get a little bit wordy for us sometimes reading it in English. It says, uh, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, a, in the heavenly places in Christ, comma, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, comma, that we would be holy and blameless before him, period. In love, he predestined us as adoption to sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, comma, according to the good pleasure of his will, comma, to the praise of his glory, of his praise, comma, with which he favored us in the beloved. Like, there were two periods in all of that thing right there. I mean, that was a very, very long-winded for you to be able to read in the New American Standard. Okay? Again, not necessarily a problem. Uh, it is the way that it is. But now, let's go to the NLT and see if I can come up with the NLT real quick. Here we go. This is the NLT. Um, this is not the NLT, that was the NLV. This is the NLT. This is gonna go over the same passage, but I think that even what's being said will make more sense to you. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. To me, that makes more sense in the NLT. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Again, more just simple, clear, 2020 type language being used here. God decided in advance to uh, adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Do you see how much easier it is to read this in the NLT? It sounds much like more like how I would be saying it to you than like a super spiritual Bible version of it. That can be really, really beneficial. It can also be really, really damaging as well. I'll show you some examples of that as well. Word for word is the uh, NASB. Word for word translated directly from the original language into its new language. Now, the next two, whenever I present these next two, everyone always feels betrayed or like people have lied to them. There's a word for word, uh, line for line, and a thought for thought. The line for line and thought for thought do not just give you a word for word, direct word for word translation. They actually mix up the words or use completely new words. To which, again, some people feel like they've been cheated or lied to, and I'll explain why that's not the case. A line-for-line -line, uh, translation means that you take the exact same sentence, exactly as it was in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, but you rearrange the words to make those words make more sense in, or, or to make that sentence flow more clearly in your language. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, many people know in Spanish, if you have an adjective, it goes after the noun in Spanish. So if I said the dog was, uh, or there was a blue dog, in Spanish, it would literally translate, there was a dog blue. 
Now, we obviously know what I meant in both you know, examples, but if I were to word it like that in English, you would be rather confused because it doesn't seem like it's it's flowing very well as a sentence. So if it was sp Spanish, it said there was, uh, the, there was the dog blue and then there was the blue dog, you would translate into English and you wouldn't think I'm doing any sort of dishonesty or manipul manipulation to the text. You'd think I'm just translating it into a different language, right? Uh, this is part of the complexities that always come with you having different languages that you're reading words in from their original language. But again, not a concern. This would be like the ESV. Uh, the NKJV would be another example. That's worth line for line. It's almost exactly the same, but it's just rewording it so that it flows a little bit better for people to read. Again, I have very little and very rare that I'll find an issue with a translation like this. And then finally, we have a thought for thought or a, a phrase for phrase, some people will call it. This is where you take an entire passage and you entirely will rearrange the passage so that the entire thing will flow very, very smoothly. It'll be just like we were to read it in today's time language. And it, it can be helpful, but it can also really, really leave out some extremely, extremely important parts of passages that uh, can more so be confusing or potentially seem deceptive. Okay, so with that would be the NLT, the NIV. Um, the message would not even count as a translation like that. It's not even defined as a translation at all. Um, but those are going to be the two most popular. Uh, uh, the CSB would be another line for line, by the way. Um, but those would be the most popular that people read the NLT and the NIV for a like a thought for thought or a phrase for phrase. And again, I love them all. I just read from the NLT and I just told you I actually like the NLT better than the NASB. Um, so, you know, in, in regards to these three types of translations, which one's the best to read? I would say all of them are. You should sometimes read, especially on a passage that you're confused or are stumped on. Yeah, I would encourage you to read it in multiple different kinds of translations because you'll come to a much clearer and better conclusion on what that passage means by reading it in different types of translations. Let me give you an example of where I just did this in, um, in Romans 12. I'm currently reading in Romans 12 and this word uh, respect. Um, oh, I'm still in the NLT. I was like, why do I not see that word there? Let me go back to my NASB real quick. It says, respect what is right in the sight of all men. Well, what do you mean respect what is right in the sight of all men? And actually has like a little, you know, a little asterisk. So you can go down here and see uh, what it means by respect. But I was like, hmm, I wonder what this says in a different translation. So then I looked up what it meant in what that phrase said uh, in the NLT. And surely enough, believe it or not, it actually makes way more sense than the NLT. And actually, I had to look up the, the Greek word there to be able to really understand what that word uh, meant um, with respect. But when I read it here, um, it's talking about, uh, let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, there we go. It says, do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. That's so much different than what I read in the NASB, right? Like entirely different than what I read in the NASB. But that actually gives you a much clearer explanation of what the original language was actually trying to say with what it was saying. Again, you would not know that if you only read the NASB. Although I love the NASB. Again, it is my personal daily reader. I will change to other translations if I believe that that other translation will be clear or easier to understand or make more sense. So those are the three kinds of translations. Uh, out of those types of translations, which are my personal tend to go to, again, there's not a right or wrong answer. If you are not reading Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic, then there is not a right or wrong answer. But again, I will tell, share with you what my personal opinions are on a handful of them. And ASV is my daily reader, so obviously I like that. ASV is another great one that's a word-for-word -word translation. Um, ESV is going to be the line-for-line -line that I always go for, uh, or NKJV. I love the NKJV as well. Uh, and then I'll read, I don't read the NIV ever. I will read the NLT, uh, will predominantly be the the thought-for-thought -thought one that I will read. I think that it is a really, really great job in a lot of places. Again, it does a large disservice to the text in other places, I believe. But those are going to be the predominant, the CEB, uh, CSB. Those are both fine. I enjoy both of those as well. But those are going to be kind of the majority of the translations or are the RSV is good and RSV is good as well uh, that I will listen to. Now, the, most people will notice that I left a handful out that are very, very common. KJV I did not mention. NIV I did not mention. Um, and the message I did not message, mention. The passion, again, if you're not in a charismatic circle, you're probably not even going to be familiar. But if you are, the passion is not going to be in there as well. Why not? 
Well, all for different reasons. The passion was, is not even a real translation. There was no translating committee who did this. If you don't know how translations work, they have a large group of people, dozens if not hundreds of people, all like come into a room together and all translate the Bible together in agreement with what the different passages are intending to mean or actually do mean. They come together and they all come to a consensus on those things, people from all different denominations, etc. cetera. Um, so that is how these translations come about. The passion translation was not that. The man who wrote the Passion Translation, he supposedly said that God gave him a uh, uh, revelation that, he, that God has never given anybody else about Aramaic and how it is this love language. And he retranslated the Bible from pretty much an angelic word from God. So many problems with that. I hopefully everybody can agree. Um, the NIV leaves out a handful of verses that were in early manuscripts because it doesn't see them as necessary to keep in there. A lot of NIV Bibles, if you look at the very bottom of it, or again, you'll see an asterisk where it will literally go from like verse 17 to verse 19. Verse 18 is nowhere to be found. Uh, at, the, at the bottom, you will be able to see, it will either clarify that it's not there or it'll tell you what that is there. Here's why I have a problem with this. Um, some people will try to paint the NIV as just trying to keep or hide things from you or trying to paint their own narrative. That is not true. It is very, very common for most of all translations to clarify this verse or this word or this phrase was only used in early manuscripts. The reason, though, that I think it's a very large disservice to just completely remove that translation is because, or excuse me, that verse from the translation is because the earliest manuscripts are the best manuscripts we have. Even if it was only said three times, but it was said three times in the earliest of manuscripts, which again, mind you, this happens a very small percentage of the time in our translations. But for the times that it does, I'm going to always resort back and trust more so the earliest manuscripts because those would have been the closest manuscripts to the original writings, meaning that it had the highest probability of being most accurate. Or again, being added. So it's not that like one would say something and the other would say the complete opposite. It would be, it's either added in or not added in in other manuscripts. I'm always going to trust the earliest and NIV removing the earliest manuscripts, again, I believe would be a very large disservice that it would be doing. So that's why I don't read the NIV. I also think some of the ways that it translates things uh, can consistently lead people to confusion. The best example of this, I think, would be Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, right? Whereas if I look at Jeremiah um, 29, uh, 11 in NASB, you will see that it's saying a very, very different thing here. Right here, it says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for uh, prosperity and not for your disaster, plans to give you a hope and a future. And again, it clarifies that word prosperity means uh, for your salvation, literally for your salvation. And other, other translations will literally say the word salvation there or a different similar phrase to salvation. Well, prosper you not to harm you, hope in a future. And he knows the plans that you have, he has for you. It sounds a lot different than he wants you to be saved and he has a destiny for you. It's way different than like you think that you're supposed to have X job and you know that God wants you to be rich one day, which is how that has often been translated by people very unfairly, very unjustly. So that things like that is why I don't like the NIV. Now, why do I not like the KJV? The reason I don't like the KJV is, first off, some dingle dongles out there say that the KJV is the only translation or the only real translation. Again, if you are not reading Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, you have such a high level of arrogance to say that your KJV is the proper translation. It doesn't make any sense. The second reason I don't like the KJV most is because it's the, one, of, one of, it's not the, but it's one of the earliest translations that we have in English. Common sense. Are you going to trust something from 15 something or something from 2000s, right? We have way more data, way more evidence, way more uh, manuscripts to go off of today uh, and in way less human error involved, right? So I'm going to go off of today's uh, stuff way more than I'm going to go off of something that old. And then lastly, you do, unless you are regularly and well-versed in old archaic English, why in the world would you think that the easiest way to understand God's word is by reading old archaic English? You're going to be very confused. Although these thines thous are one part of it, but then also a bunch of words that you just do not use today that they used back then, right? Uh, one of the examples would be uh, in, in 1 Corinthians or Romans chapter 12, excuse me, where it says, I beseech you. Do you know what the word beseech means? Unless you are, again, have looked that word up, you have no idea what the word beseech means. And most people do not look up words that regularly when they're studying their Bibles. So you'll just go through your scripture reading and see the word beseech and not have any idea what it means and you just keep reading. Well, you don't know what the entire passage means if you don't know what the word beseech means. When he says, I beseech you, what does beseech mean? Well, it actually means to urge you or to encourage you or push you. But I only know that because I was able to look at it myself. And again, in the NASB, it says, I urge you. It does not say beseech. So there's a lot of words that are just simply not used in our vocabulary today that were used back then. Uh, and then lastly, when you're trying to talk to people and you're trying to quote Old Testament passages or New Testament passages in 1500s language, like, guys, 
people are not going to be able to relate with that at all. And I'm not, no, I'm not saying you have to be relatable. Like, again, I'm not like tattoos and nose rings because I got to be relatable to this generation. Like, let's have pizza and Xbox nights at youth group. No, I'm so super against those things. But what I am saying is people aren't literally going to be able to comprehend what you're saying because you're speaking in an old language. Whereas if you're speaking, and again, any of those modern translations, they'll be able to understand what you mean. They might not fully know what it means, but they'll be able to at least understand the concept that's being said because you're not speaking in King James English. So I strongly urge people, uh, it's very discouraging. If you've ever tried to read it, it's very discouraging to try to read the Bible. It's hard enough to read it. It's harder to study it. It's even harder when you're doing it in a language you don't even speak anymore. So I strongly urge people to not do it unless you're like, dude, I've read it my whole life. I understand all those words. I've looked them up myself. If you want to do that, cool. Like there's nothing wrong with the, the translation. It's just not the best translation. Like people will try to act like that translation is. All right. So now if we go back to our little uh, PDF down here, we know who uh, the Bible uh, translation that you should be reading, the different types of translations that there are. We've gone over everything above. Next thing we need to go into is, is the Bible written for me? Okay. Um, this one, I think, obviously, I, I, I like from the context of this conversation, I think that you already know the answer to this question. Yes, that it's made for you. But I think that the more important question about this is, what in the Bible is made for me? And how, do, how, how can I discern what is and is not made for me? And by the way, we're going to go through some literary uh, lessons in regards to scripture here in a moment as well that are going to be really, really beneficial that I did not write down there. Um, the Bible is written for you, especially the New Testament. Any of the Bible stories, because, you know, men, earlier I'd mentioned, you know, 613 laws and 10 commandments are not made for us. We don't live under the old covenant. We're not Jews. Jesus brought a new covenant and he abolished the old one with the new one. Now that we have this new covenant that we live under, uh, we are supposed to do what the New Testament commands us to. Now, with that being said, uh, any of the stories we're supposed to look back at, just like 1 Corinthians 10 that we looked at earlier, told us to. We're supposed to look back at these stories and learn from them. So Dave and Goliath, Jonah and the whale, Noah and the ark, all of the common stories that we're used to hearing are equally as relevant to us, as well are any commands given in scripture in the Old Testament that are not part of the 613 laws and 10 commandments. So again, a great example of that would be in the Shema in Deuteronomy when it tells us we should love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That statement right there is not one of the 613 laws that are mentioned. So that would be a great example of something that you and I are supposed to do that's still mentioned in the Old Testament. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, anything New Testament related, uh, sexual morality, hatred is murder. Um, I, I mentioned lust, uh, any sort of anger or hatred that somebody has, any sort of pride, arrogance, any sort of dishonesty, lying, any sort of theft, um, any sort of uh, intentionally false teachings or doctrines. These things are all still sin. We're supposed to follow all those things, and those things are all written for us. Um, and again, it's also important to consider when we're looking at the letters of Paul, that these things are all written, again, not to you specifically, but for you to glean something from. So although he might be telling somebody, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that the man who's sleeping with his stepmom has been kicked out of their fellowship or that Paul had, and he said, I handed this brother over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that he's, his soul might be saved on the day of judgment. Well, obviously, we can't take anything literal from that if you don't know anybody who's sleeping with their stepmom. But you can take the principles of that story and apply them to your life, right? Uh, so when we see somebody in our fellowship and we know that they're living an evident, clear, habitual sin, that we can call them out on that sin. And if they don't repent from it, per Matthew 18, bring a group. If they still don't, bring them in front of the whole church. If they still don't, then you remove them from your midst so that they might see the error of their ways and come back to Christ one day, right? So again, regardless of what the sin is, it's still relevant. So that's a great example of how you can use passages in scripture that were not necessarily written for you or about you, but still understand how you can use those for training and righteousness for yourself. So the entirety of the Bible is written um, for you to glean something from and to learn uh, and study from, which also brings me to the point of reading versus studying. It's very, very easy to read the Bible. Anybody can read the Bible and just like see the words on a page just like you were to read a tweet or a Facebook post or an X, whatever, x.com. Uh, like you can, you can read through anything quickly, a uh, blog, an article post, but that's not studying. Studying is where you break down what is happening. The majority of people who know anything about the scriptures know from reading it, not from actually studying it. And it's encouraged, it's commanded in scripture that we study, that we rightly divide the word of truth. So we as Christians ought to know the word by studying it. So reading it every day, breaking it down, looking at the Greek, 
Hebrew uh, and, and seeing those, the, the, you know, some of those words, uh, learning from other people who are smarter than us and, and things like that. So it's important that we're actually studying the word. Devotionals are an, a, a way that you can do that. Uh, reading books about specific topics is another, again, great way that you can do that. It's crucial that we as Christians are because you need to really understand what these things mean because of 1 Peter 3.15, to be ready at all times to give a defense for the hope that's within you. And you can't do that if you don't know what the word is itself in the first place. So um, we need to make sure that reading isn't one of those things that we just do to get done for the day or whatever, but it's actually not only training us in righteousness and helping us defend our faith, but also helping us actually live more like Jesus. The whole point of the, like reading and all this stuff in the first place is to look more like him. And if we're not looking more like him in the process, then we're missing the entire point for the Bible's existence, right? It's supposed to teach us about the story and then show us how we are supposed to live uh, godly. So it's crucial that we don't forget some of those things. The Bible was written for us. Let's talk about different views of the Bible um, that different people have. Well, uh, I have yet to mention this part is that some people see the Bible as a good story. Some people see it as a bunch of parables. Um, some people see the whole thing as an analogy or an allegory or a lot of it as analogies and allegories and that the stories are actually made up, especially the Old Testament stories. I've heard, uh, especially progressive thinkers say everything from the creation story to Adam and Eve to Noah. Uh, th these were actually never real. They never actually happened in the first place. It was just like a, uh, an allegory or the Job story. It was an allegory. It was never been, or a parable, never meant to be taken seriously or literally. I think that this can tread dangerous ground. I don't think in and of itself it does, but it can tread dangerous grounds. And the reason is, where is your line where you stop saying something is a parable and saying it's literal? Right? Because again, objectively, what is wrong with somebody thinking that Job could be an allegory or, or, or a parable? Well, nothing. There's nothing damaging about that at all. Where the concern arises is if that could be a parable, what else could be a parable? Could Jesus' Sermon on the Mount just be a structure on how to um, create sermons on just three-point sermons? Or was there an actually a more important principle that he was trying to get at there? Well, your understanding or your opinion or your view on these things will significantly change the way that you live. I know people who don't believe that Job was real, and they also don't see a big problem with homosexuality. How they make that jump might seem strange, but it's not really that strange at all if you really think about that person's line of logic. They are just trying to make a claim to say, well, all of this stuff is kind of a parable anyway. So no, it's not like we could really ever even know what is true versus not true, which is a very, very dangerous way to look at the Bible. It is the truth. It is real. Yes, there are parables in it. But again, the majority of the Bible is pretty darn clear to understand which of it, uh, which parts of it are parables or, or allegories or analogy and what parts literally happen. And things like allegories are actual events that happen that are foretelling of future events, right? Um, uh, of, you know, or different pictures that are going to come up later in scripture. But it's important that we have a view of, of scripture that it is true. That the things that are said are actual commands that are literal commands given literally to us, that the events literally happened. Um, because if not, then you can start skirting out of a lot of different um, like ways that you're supposed to live and just say, oh, well, well we're just going to discount that as again, whatever, it's a parable, or he was just giving a figure of speech, right? I've heard this used with even Matthew 5, where people say, you know, you've heard of the prophets of old, do not commit adultery. Well, I say, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. And I've heard people make, you know, references of like, oh, well, Jesus is just trying to show you that sin's a big deal. No, that's not what he, I mean, yes, he is trying to show you that sin's a big deal, but he literally meant that too. He literally meant that you should not take this, uh, you know, and, or you should not live in any sort of sexual immorality. And then they'll try to push their point further by being like, well, do you think Jesus literally was wanting people to cut their hands off and cast it from them? Well, no, I don't think so. I think he was using hyperbole to show a point of how serious it was. But it doesn't mean that his point on sexual morality was hyperbole. And this is the kind of claim or the kind of jump that people want to make. Again, always, it's always for the purpose of them being able to live the way that they wanted to live. Now, the next aspect of this is the cultural claims. There are certain things that are unquestionably cultural, right? Um, certain things in scripture were uh, commanded or emphasized or even just spoken about because it was, it would have made sense culturally. Let me give you a really good example of that. This is one that no one's going to squirm at either. They put a purple robe on Jesus when they went to crucify him. Why did they do that? Well, today, if I put a purple robe on you, you wouldn't think anything of it. You'd be like, cool, thanks. But there would be no emphasis or importance in that. Well, what was the importance back then? Well, it was because purple was a fine linen and it was seen as royalty. So it was an aspect of mockery. They put a purple robe on him and gave him a crown made of thorns. 
which again, I don't, I never hear people really talk about that. Like the point was to mock him and giving him a thorn crown to hurt him and to make him look even more humiliated and to mock the fact that he's actually not a king. That's what they were trying to do. And the purple robe was just part of that. Again, today, if I wore a wooden crown and had a purple robe on, that would mean nothing to people today. In the same way, there are uh, different cultural things that are mentioned in scriptures that's important to understand, oh, this is scriptural, or this is this is something that you need to have the context of culture at that time, but the sins are not in that category. So again, sexual morality is not one of those things. Idolatry is not one of those things. Although idolatry and physical idols was more popular back then, maybe, idolatry in the concept or the principle of it was not, right? Um, being dishonest or being manipulative or being haughty in your mind. Although they might have used that or that may have played out in a different way back then, doesn't mean that it's not a command that we are to live by today as today time Christians. So some people will try to make those jumps and claims and they are very dangerous ones to go into. The next one I want to jump into is the topic of allegories. This is one of those things that um, Christians sadly today don't know almost anything about and it will really significantly uh, impact your understanding of scripture. So it's important that we know these things. We're going to go over allegories. Types and figures, hyperlinks, and uh, and a few more things that are similarly related to this. So what are allegories? If you remember, we'll go back to just our um, uh, high school days, elementary days, and see what allegories are. It's a story or poem that uh, a picture can be interpreted and reveal a hidden meaning, typically in a moral or a political one, right? So... Let's go to an example in scripture where we see this happen. Um, I'm actually not going to read it because it's a rather hefty story, um, but I'll just explain this one to you and you'll understand it. We see uh, that Abraham, he goes and sacrifices his son Isaac on the mountain, right? It's a mountain called Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where he goes to crucify his son. He said, let us go up the mountain to worship. And he goes to sacrifice his only begotten son. And God provides a ram in the thicket for him to sacrifice instead. Notice I use the phrase, his only begotten son. Abraham had um, more children than just Isaac, though. So why did he say his only begotten son? Well, the emphasis here is that it's obviously supposed to be an allegory or a, a foretelling of, a, of another story in the future of God sacrificing his only son, right? And the only difference in the two stories, obviously, is that the, the ram in the thicket, the, the lamb who was slain in this scenario, was Jesus. And that the hand was not stopped this time, right? Another great example is clarified in Galatians, but Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau are a spiritual picture, an allegory for law and grace, the old covenant and the new covenant. They are spiritual pictures of that because the former will overtake the latter, or the latter will overtake the former. And all of the things that are partake in that story, if you remember that story about him selling his birthright. And uh, Esau, uh, the law, sold its birthright to um Jacob, because it said, you know, the, the former is greater than the latter in value and importance and, and obviously most importantly, our salvation. So this is another example of, of an allegory that is popularly referenced in scripture. And the cool thing is these allegories happen all of the time. They're constantly happening in scripture. And a lot of times we just miss them. The reason these are important to discuss is because if you do not notice them, if you do not recognize them, then there's a lot of things that are not going to be clear to you in scripture when these, again, references are made back to Old Testament passages. Um, another great example of these is, you know, I, I mentioned allegories, but now I want to go to um, the next one of the hyperlinks here. Hyperlinks are uh, examples in scripture where there is an Old Testament reference. I discussed this a little bit earlier, but I want to go more in depth on this. That is not necessarily quoted. Again, the quoted ones are very easy because you can just see they're generally referenced as quotes. But the ones that are not so easy, not so common, uh, not so clear are the ones that are not quoted, right? We have uh, ones like in 2 Corinthians, it says, the God who once shone in your heart or um, uh, the God who uh, called light out of darkness has now shown in your heart. That is a direct reference to Genesis chapter one, right? In the beginning, God said, let there be light. That was a direct reference to that. And I never noticed that, noticed that myself until like, <laughs> excuse me, a year or two ago that he was referencing back to um, the creation story, right? So this is an example of a hyperlink that we see in the New Testament. Uh, other hyperlinks are, again, very evident because it's a, a direct quote from an Old Testament passage um, or, or again, like 1 Corinthians 10, where it's explaining something that was in the Old Testament that's just kind of assumed or implied that you're familiar with that story. 
Um, but there's plenty of others that are not that way that you're just kind of expected by the author to already know what they're talking about. Um, one of them is in Hebrews when it's referring to Melchizedek. If you don't know who Melchizedek is, you're going to be very confused by that story, right? Very, very confused. Because uh, Melchizedek is a really short character. He doesn't have a whole lot to play, but uh, Hebrews takes two or three chapters to break down in depth who he is. Again, hyperlinking to the Old Testament. Let's go to some more examples here. <clears throat> we look here on the Sermon on the Mountain. It says, <clears throat> this is right before Jesus gives his first sermon. It says, and he opened his mouth and began to teach. Why would there be an emphasis on the fact that he opened his mouth? Isn't it kind of implied that if you speak, you've got to open your mouth? Well, what if there's something more intentional that they're trying to get you to notice? That again, maybe a Jew who knew his Old Testament well would have noticed. Well, the only other time that scripture ever uses the phrase, and he opened his mouth, was when Moses first had a conversation with God on Mount Sinai. Interesting. Jesus is on a mountain giving his first speech. God is on a mountain giving Moses his first speech about the law. Again, back to that law and grace analogy that we discussed earlier. How about Exodus 19? It says, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Well, is there any other time that you can think of in scripture where the finger of God is referenced? Uh, it's actually referenced in Jesus's life. And it specifies in John 8 with the adulterous woman's story that he wrote with his finger on the ground. Why do you think it says with his finger on the ground? Now, it obviously doesn't say the finger of God because that would be obvious, like too obvious. But uh, it's the only other time that a reference of using your finger <clears throat> To write is any sort of reference, right? Uh, let's go actually further in John 8, where uh, it has the I am statement. Uh, where is this at? Yeah, right here. It says, truly, truly, I say before Abraham was, I am. Well, again, there's supposed to be a hyperlink, an obvious hyperlink for you to recognize there. The only other time that I am is said by anybody in scripture is God when he is with, again, Moses. He says, who do I say sent him? Say, tell them that I am sent you. Uh, again, it was another one of those references back to the Old Testament with these hyperlinks pushing you back and saying, hey, remember this story back then? That's another one of those things that's happening right now. So there's times like this all throughout scripture. I could be here for days going through different examples of these types and figures, allegories and hyperlinks in scripture. They're clearly supposed to be getting you thinking back to something in the Old Testament. I'll give you one more that I think is an easy one. It's a softball, but it's, an, it's another really good one for you to, um, you know, just keep in mind when you're going through your reading. In the beginning was, where does in the beginning ever happen again? Well, obviously that's going to happen again in Genesis 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in here, it's going on another kind of poetic trail of this in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So, there's obviously no accident here in the way that these things are being written. They're being written in an in, in assumption that you understand the context of Jesus being God and how Jesus was there at, the, at creation and that the Father was creating things. Like, this, this is no accident that these things are in here. And they're in there to remind you of like, hey, you should like go back to keep these things in mind. Uh, one of the books that you should go to when it comes to just the context uh, or the concept in general is just the book of Matthew itself, right? The book of Matthew goes through, uh, it's the most Jewish of the gospels, right? Let's go to another one that I want to do just because I'm having fun with this thing. We see that uh, John the Baptist is in the wilderness and he's preaching, right? And he says, you brood or offspring of vipers. You were warned to, who, who warned you from the, uh, to flee from the wrath that, that's to come, right? So he's rebuking the Pharisees here and he calls them a brood of vipers. You are children of snakes, what, what is the emphasis or the importance of calling them brood of vipers? Um, is the offense the fact that, that um, they're just an animal? Or, or what, what is the real offense there? Well, again, you're supposed to have a, a picture coming into your mind. Of, I feel like I've heard a story about a snake before that was bad. Satan in the garden, right? That's what this is supposed to get you thinking of. It's like, oh, that's a reference to, to the serpent in the garden. A lot of these tree references that you see in scripture, a lot of snake references that you see in scripture, a lot of dirt, uh, heaven, water, they all are generally talking about the same thing. Let's talk about another type or a figure here because I haven't really gone into the types and figures aspect of this is water, right? Uh, I'm not going to be able to really show this one because it's going to take a long time to read as well, but no one in the ark, right? Uh, they were supposed to be saved from the water, right? Um, they were on top of the water and the water is allegorical for death or judgment. 
Uh, we see this all throughout scripture whenever we see uh, this, this water reference mentioned. Baptism is you dying in the water and you coming back up to life in newness of Christ, right? Um, fire is another good uh, allegorical concept is fire is always referenced to purification of some capacity, right? We, we see it uh, in 1 Corinthians 3 of like, you know, uh, that you'll be on the day of ju- or on the judgment seat of Christ, that anything that's built with wood, hay, and straw is going to be burned up in the fire. But anything made with gold, gems, and precious jewels, a stone, excuse me, is going to stand the test and actually is going to be purified by the fire. Radchek, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They were in the fire and it said that they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. That They went through the fire and they looked, if anything, more like Jesus on the other side of going through the fire, right? Uh, God's going to wipe out and purify the earth with fire one day when he goes to wipe out the entirety of the earth. Um, we see you know, in the, uh, the parables, like Matthew 25 of the parable of the virgins that they had either had their lampstands filled or they did not have their lampstands filled. They were either living in purity, righteousness, holiness, pure, they were living pure, or they were not living pure. We could go on and on and on with all these different analogies, uh, or these, t- uh, these um, types and figures that we see throughout scripture. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the obvious ones is like a sheep, you know, like us as sheep or Jesus is the lamb that was slain. So there's ones like that as well, but we could go again on and on and on with whenever we see these, Generally, we will see them repeated in the same way a sword is another example, right? Jesus is going to come back with his tongue being a sword. Well, what does that mean? Well, the word is referred to as a sword, a two-edged sword, able to divide the joint from the marrow, soul from the spirit, able to judge the intentions of a man's heart. That's Hebrews 4.12. And Jesus' mouth is that tongue. The tongue is the word. The sword is the word in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 with the, the armor of God. So my point is, is that, that all of these different examples that we see are all about a sword and Jesus is going to come out with the sword in, in judgment one day. So again, the sword is always in reference to the same thing scripturally from beginning to end of the Bible. These things are really fun to go through because, again, they can keep pushing you back to past stories in the Bible or even future stories in the Bible if you're already in the Old Testament that should be, again, bringing off these, like, aha light bulb moments in your mind, right? Um, Most of all of the light or darkness references in Scripture are oftentimes in reference to the Genesis story, right? Uh, We are the light of the world. Um, So, you know, God said, let there be light. We are the light of the world. Um, that there's darkness doesn't want to be exposed. Uh, what, what is darkness a reference to? It's obviously in reference to people not being born again, but it's in reference to chaos, right? Um, that, that Like the Genesis 1 reference of darkness is that there was this dark void, this abyss, this chaos that was going on, and God brought order to the chaos. So all of these darkness and light references that we see in scripture are the same thing. Food references are the same thing. Feasting references are the same concept. Like these are all things that have the same track line throughout the entirety of the scripture because God was trying to interweave these concepts all throughout the Bible. So it wouldn't just be something that like, you know, at a later point it was like, oh, okay, I get it. No, no, no. The whole thing is like this whole track record of all of these points all lining up together. So hopefully that can make sense to you all as well. All right, final points here. Um, I'm going to go through the cons or the, the, the tools that I personally use when I'm going to study through scripture. And then I'm going to show you actually how I go in my studies as well. So let's talk about a few different tools that I use on a daily basis. So first tool that I encourage you to use is the Blue Letter Bible. They have an app as well. Uh, It is not the most aesthetically pleasing thing, but it has everything that you could possibly want in it. Let's assume that you for a second want to uh, learn about, um, let's say John 1, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I'm going to have to do this in a different way. Let's try here. Sorry, I'm not super used to using the uh, website version of this. I always use the app. So in the beginning, we see this tool that we can use here. We can either uh, look at a uh, a concordance. We can cross-reference commentaries, dictionaries, etc. So this is going to be a really good tool for you to learn. Let's assume that you're like, hey, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, the word is God. What is that word for word in Greek? Well, this gives you the Strong's uh, number for it. But let's click on it and see what this word actually means in its original language. We can go to the outline of biblical usage, which is just like the context of how the word is used over and over again throughout scripture. And then we can look at the actual strong definition right here. And the word is logos. um, And it will explain to you exactly what that is. So you can look in here and learn what the word means. And if you want to hear what the word means, you can press play on the actual sound of the word. And it will literally show you in Greek what that word would mean. So this will show you with a lot of different words. uh, I mean, literally every word in the Bible, which is really beneficial. 
Uh, you can look at it in different Bible translations if you would like to. Uh, you can cross-reference to other passages. Again, I just mentioned earlier how this was a, you know, a tie on Genesis 1-1. And again, it clarifies that here with that in the beginning phrase. Um, and then finally is it does Bible commentaries. So I can listen to what other experts who have written, who came long before you and me, have said about Genesis or Romans 1, right? So I can look up what Bob Davis has to say. Uh, one of the guys who I always listen to is Matthew Henry. I really like Matthew Henry's commentaries. But you can go through all of these different commentaries, again, for free, at the touch of a fingertip on your phone, on a mobile app on your phone, and look and do a deep dive into what these people are saying. Uh, Chuck Smith is great too, um, with you know these deep dives into scripture. So Blue Letter Bible app is going to be the first one. Again, it's not the most aesthetically pleasing, but it has all the tools and resources in one place. I have, not in this room with me, I think it's in my kitchen, but I have a massive textbook version. It's huge. I mean, it's bigger than a textbook. It's like an encyclopedia size. So that's going to be the first uh, thing that I'm going to use. So the, these two are a commentary and a concordance. Cor concordances are massive, massive commentaries are generally massive as well, uh, but they do really good job. And, and again, maybe I should have clarified that better. Uh, uh, what a, a concordance does is it just takes it from its original language in Greek or Hebrew and it directly translates it into English and gives you the original definition in their language. Let me give you a simple example. If I say the word gay, you assume that I'm referring to same-sex attraction, right? If I were to say this in the 1920s, I'd be referring to happy. Um, similarly, the word fag, if I were to say that, it's usually a derogatory phrase for somebody who has same-sex attraction. If you were to say that in the 1920s in England, you would be referring to a cigarette that you were requesting from somebody, right? Again, way different meanings to these words that we have today. In the same way back then, they would have had different meanings and understandings of their words than the words that we use today. We are just trying to, in the best way possible, translate those words into English uh, in the best way we can. There are 5 million, I believe, words in Greek, and there are 1 million words in English. So we're trying to get, you know, in, in, you know, mathematically, five words packed into a single word in English, which is very difficult to do. For example, there are three Greek words to the word love, or four, actually, but... There's three commonly used in the Greek language, right? We have um, we have uh, uh, phileo, we have um, eris, don't quote me on that one, uh, and then we have agape love, right? And these three different loves mean entirely different things, but the English word for every one of them is love. If you don't know what those things are, you're not going to know what you're trying to be learning in that passage. That's why it's important to use a commentary uh, in certain areas. Now, don't get overwhelmed. Uh, you know, what I do personally, and some smarter people will probably disagree with this, but I just pray and ask God, like, reveal to me the words that you want me to look up, um, which might sound like a cheap cop out, but like, I'm not going to look up the and, but, or they, et cetera. Um, I'm going to be looking up words that really stick out to me. And, but usually they're pretty obvious words, right? Like, like the typical churchy words, righteousness, holiness, sanctification, consecration, etc. right? So it's usually those words that you're like, man, I think I know what it means, but I'm not sure if I fully know what it means. I want to look it up. So those are the words that I'm going to look up in scripture. Um, so that's what a commentary is and a concordance, or that's what a concordance is, excuse me. A commentary is going through other smart people who have broken down, pretty much done a massive in-depth Bible study verse by verse and explaining all of them in their contextual passage and showing you how it is. Some of them will show you how it's relatable to your life. So like, hey, here's what John 1-1 one -one means. Here's the reference to Genesis 1-1. One -one, and here's how you can actually like live out this in your life or what it has to do with you today. So that, that's what a lot of commentaries do. So it's really good for if you don't understand what a passage means or you're not sure if you understand what a passage means, it will explain what that passage means to you. So Again, very smart tool to use. Now, as kind of a part B to that is uh, Bible Project, right? So most people, I think, by now uh, know what Bible Project is. If you don't know what Bible Project is, you need to get your life together. Oops, that was not what I wanted to go to. I guess it's BibleProject.com. These guys are do uh, these visualizations of um, like animations, visualizations of the Bible. And they will talk about everything from different uh, topics to different books of the Bible, et cetera. And you can watch them. And again, they'll have these really cool animations. Your kid, I mean, my children love it, but also like me as a grown adult, I learn from it all the time as well. They have podcasts as well. They have free Bible classes that you can go through. You don't get uh, accredited or it's not a degree that you get from it. But Tim Mackey is a Western seminary, was a Western seminary uh, Bible teacher. So like you're getting literal Bible teaching from college seminaries that a pastor would go through or higher level, and you're getting them for free. It's called Classroom. Um, again, I have no affiliation with them. I've just been so blessed by them. And then they have something called Read Scripture. Um, let me see if I can find their Read Scripture really quick. Here, um, they just have it as overviews right now. But it'll just take whatever book that you're reading through right now, and it will take you through, again, this uh, you know whole study 
through it and it'll say, hey, here's what the whole book of Second Thessalonians is about. Here's the context. Here's the author. Here's why it was writing. Here's who it's writing to. Here's like it gives you everything. It is so amazing. I love the Bible Project. So they're humans. They're not always right on everything, right? Surprise, surprise. But 95, 99% of the time, I'm 100% on board with everything they have to teach. So Bible Project is another really, really great resource. Obviously, preachers, pastors, et cetera, are also very great resources. Um, the only problem is, and, and I'm not, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying here, but a lot of preachers are preaching from sermon series that they've heard or from something that they've came up with themselves. But most of them, most pastors in America are not true Bible teachers or Bible students themselves. It's just the reality. They're misinformed about a lot of things. They're doing what they've been personally taught themselves sometime in the past, and they're not going to be the best place to get advice from. I'm sorry, but Stephen Furtick is not the theologian you want breaking down the Bible for you. He's just not. Um, Joel Osteen is not the guy you want breaking down the Bible for you. Um, Bill Johnson from Bethel Church is not the guy you want breaking down the Bible for you. They all have great things to say. They all have great, I've learned uh, scriptural things from every single one of these people. When it comes to the best people to listen to, none of them are those people. Uh, you want to be listening to people who are like real Bible theologians for your information um, about these topics. So, concordance, um, commentaries, Blue Letter Bible app. Uh, another great resource for people. This is a more of a layman's tool, but it's called gotquestions.org. Again, not always right, but 90% of the time they are. Uh, you know, ask whatever the question that you want to ask is. Um, uh, who is Mel... I don't know how to spell Kizidek. Uh It'll come up with something here. Uh, it's it's easier to do it on Google than on their website. But anyways, let's say who is Melchizedek in the Bible? And then what questions will be one of the first ones that come up, I'm sure, anyways, after the sponsored stuff. Yeah, there we go. So who who is Melchizedek? And then it'll go and it'll give you a really great layman's explanation of who they were. Here's another one. I remember looking this up seven years ago. Uh, what is is a Pharisee, right? Again, just one of those things that like everybody like talks about in the Bible. But if you never looked it up before, you don't know what a, a Pharisee actually is. And again, they give you a great answer to what a Pharisee is. So again, it's written in layman's terms. Anybody can understand it. You don't need to be a smart Bible wizard to be able to do it. But this right here is a great resource for you to use if you have quick questions about scriptural things. Another one of the ones that I use all the time that people have been really blessed by is Open Bible. Open Bible is really good, .info, um, because you can type in any sort of topic that you want, any passage that you want to learn more about, and it will teach you about that specific topic. So, for example, I want to know about um, hell in the Bible, and then I'm going to do Open Bible. And what this does is it'll find every single passage in the Bible that has a reference to or says the word hell in it. But again, the cool thing is it doesn't have to say the word hell. So, like, it'll reference to the lake of fire or shield or et cetera. And it will give you all of these. And you can just keep going through all of the different verses. So like specifically, if you're trying to do a Bible study on a word, you want to know what the word love means or you want to know what hell is, uh, or et cetera. These are really, really good tools for you to use to be able to do that. So I really encourage everybody to use openbible.info. And again, not sponsored by any of these people, no affiliation with any of these people. There's tools that I personally use myself and have learned a tremendous about, uh, amount about when it comes to learning and growing. So those are going to be some of the tools that I use outside of those. Um, that, that's pretty much the majority of what I use when it comes to uh, what tools I use to study the Bible. So the next step that we're going to go into is I'm actually going to go and do a Bible study with you here so that you can see how I study the Bible and the strategy that I use in studying. It's called the inductive study method. So let's jump into that. Now for the final part of this series, which is how do I study the Bible? Because all of what I just said is nice and fine and dandy, but if you don't know how to study the Bible, it's going to be extremely challenging for you to be able to really grow and learn from the things that you are reading. There's a lot of different strategies you can go about. I'm going to explain what I do and why, and why I believe that you should probably do it too, but there's plenty that you can go and research. We do what is called the inductive study method. The inductive study method is a simple uh, way of saying that we're figuring out what the Bible says, what this passage says that we're reading, what it means, and then how it does it apply to my life. Why is it so important that we know all three of these aspects? Most people 
can give you a okay rendition of what it says, give you a poor rendition of what it means, and give you zero understanding of how that passage applies to your life. Guys, the Bible has a purpose, and the purpose of these scriptures is to teach us about living godly, right? I believe I quoted this earlier, but 2 Peter uh, 1, 3 says, God has given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. This is important for us to note because if we're not living different because of the reading that we're doing of this book that we've been having this entire conversation about, then what's the point of reading it in the first place? The only reason that we have this book in the first place is so that we can grow up in Christ in all things and look more like him, come to the fullness of the stature of Christ so that we can come to perfection. And if we don't know what it's trying to say to us, what is it, how does it apply to me today? Then there's not a whole, a whole lot of use for it at all, right? So it's important that we know how to apply these things. So I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to take some notes together is one of the things we're going to do here. And I'm going to give you a short example of me doing this uh, in a passage. Uh, and then we are going to go over me doing all three of these aspects in uh, any given capacity. So anyways, let me go to a blank page here and we are going to do it on, let's say, I'm going to throw myself a, an easy one here, which is Matthew chapter five. By the way, uh, I do my Bible studies in paper and a pen. Um, just so you know, this is just what I personally choose to do. That's not the right way to do it or something like that, but it is it is what I choose to do. And I have found uh, the most amount of success from doing it that way. So I have done it uh, before digitally and I'm just not a big fan. Um, so what I'll do is on the indented part of the paper, um, on the other side of the blue line, I'll put the number of the verse that I'm reading and then we will read it and then go over all of these three things. So, and I'm going to show you how to figure out all these things too, by the way. So fear not. Got an NASB here. And on verse one, which is where we started, it says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And after he sat down, he, uh, his disciples came with him. So there's obviously not a tremendous amount that appears on the surface level to apply to your life, but I want to break this down so I understand more why the author is saying these things in the way he is, and specifically Matthew, obviously, in this context, right? So the first thing I'm going to say is, uh, you know, um, why is he on a mountain, right? Uh, and then I'm going to do some research on that, right? So now, in theory, what I would do is ask just straight up on Google or got questions, why was Jesus on the mountain? Let me look if it has an answer. Sermon on a mountain. Chad GPD did not give me a lot to work with there. This says, um, in the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus corrects false teaching uh, of other religious leaders of the day. They were misunderstanding God's word. It doesn't seem like this is giving me a lot to work with. So now what I would do is I would just look up Matthew 5, commentary. And then I'd look up Matthew Henry probably first and see if he has anything to say about it. And again, I've, I've never looked this up, by the way. So this is just going to be my, my first time going through it as well. Could potentially not be of much use to me uh, at all. I'm going to make me smaller here and this a little bit bigger. It says, the preacher was our Lord Jesus, the prince of preachers and the great prophet in his church who came into the world. He was the light of the world, the prophet. Uh, and John had, I'm trying to see if there's going to be anything in here that is going to be beneficial. Also, I, yeah, I'm in Matthew 5. It looks like it's giving an overview uh, first. It was a mountain in Galilee, as in other things. So in this, the Lord Jesus was... But ill accommodated, he had no convenient place to preach or to lay his head, while the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' chair with all possible ease and honor in a state in uh, a corrupted law. Our Lord Jesus, the great teacher of truth, is driven out into the desert and finds no better pulpit other than a mountain can afford, and not only a holy mount, or not only, and not one of a holy mountain either, not one of the mountains of Zion, but a common mountain by which Christ would. Uh, Intimate would intimate that there is no such distinguished holy place now under the gospel and there under the law. So this is really good. This isn't something I would have originally put, uh, but this is powerful, right? This right here is saying that Jesus, one of the aspects was uh, Jesus wasn't invited to preach in the fancy places like the Pharisees. I'm not going to correct my grammar, by the way. I know I'm going to make some, some mistakes, but just for time's sake. 
Um, and also that the true worshipers don't worship here or there, but worship in spirit and truth. We are the holy temple of God. Therefore, we don't need a fancy building, right? So this is one of the things that I would put here, right? Um, so, you know, what, what here is, what does it say? What does it mean? Has it applied to my life? I think we can get the, what does it say? What does it mean part down from what I just written? But um, where do we get the, how does it apply to my life? Here's what I'm going to say. I don't need religious leaders to tell me when or where I can speak the truth, whether it is a Bible study house church or discipleship i can preach the word and help people grow in the truth regardless of when or where right so this is the application aspect of this right that uh jesus was preaching anywhere that he wanted to go and he was just preaching because there was a crowd of people following him. Therefore, why can't I do the exact same thing? What's stopping me from preaching to the crowds in the same way, right? Uh, let's go to the next verse. He opened his mouth and began saying, uh, that's not going to give you a whole lot to work with other than what I'd mentioned earlier in regards to the allegory of um, the Ten Commandments at uh, Mount Sinai. So blessed is the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom. So straight up, what I would do here, like literally what I would do is if you're not going to put down what I just mentioned, I'm just going to completely skip verse two. I'm not going to have something great to expound upon every single verse, by the way. Also, I should clarify, uh, sometimes depending on what season of life I'm in, I've had times where I will go through the same process in greater lengths or lesser lengths. Currently, I'm going through like in much greater lengths. So I'll do like three to four verses a day generally. Uh, and that usually takes me like 45 minutes to an hour to go through. Uh, I've had other times in my life where I just do like a whole chapter in an hour. Uh, and that's fine too. Uh, I think it kind of depends on how much you can handle. Uh, remember, the point is not that you know more. The point is that you are a doer of the word. So if you need to go through, you know, whatever for, you know, six months to be able to do it uh, well, then take six months. If you can get it done in 30 days or excuse me, 30 minutes, then do that too. Uh, I don't want to put like these like legalistic rules on it. There's nothing scripturally that tells you any of those things anyways. Um, but just letting you know what I do. So the first thing I'm going to do here is obviously I can see if I'm reading ahead a little bit, it says, blessed, 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 blessed. These are the Beatitudes, right? I want to know what the word blessed means, right? Because the whole frame of understanding all of these, you know, eight or so verses that use the phrase blessed in them are knowing what the word blessed means. So let's go to blb.org. I'm going to go to blueletterbible.org and we're going to look up that word blessed and we're going to look it up in the... Let's do the NASB if I can find it. Here we go. And we are going to look up in here. It would be easier for me just to do Matthew 5. Awesome. So one of the things that we might want to look up is, are all of these words for blessed the same word? Um, from my experience of studying it already, I would tell you that, yes, it is. But again, I only know that because I've studied it before. So, uh, you know, you can hear it if you want to. Strong's G, 3107, Makarias. 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 Okay. I want to see what other ways uh, the word is translated in the Bible, right? This is, again, this isn't going to be like the deal breaker, but, you know, it'll tell you how many times. It says blessed, happy, and happier. Uh, 44 times, five times. So, so evidently the word blessed or blessed is going to be the most consistent that we're seeing. Um, the outline of biblical usage, I will probably put more weight on than the Strong's Concordance. I don't know if I said this already, uh, but if I didn't, um, then I want to emphasize that. And the reason is because I, I don't have any problem with jo James Strong's Concordance, but the Strong's Concordance is going to give more of like an objective definition, almost like a today time Webster Marion would give. And it's not going to give as relevant of what the author actually meant with every single time he used the word. Let me give you an example. Uh, the word love is going to be pretty much what we expect it to mean. So when we see the Greek strong coordinates of the three times that the word love is used in the Bible, I think there's four Greek words in all for love. And then we look at, you know, how uh, the outline of biblical usage or the context of the passage that the word love is used in, it's pretty much going to be the exact same. But if we look at um, a word like grace, right? Um, charisma, or charis, which is the Greek word for that. It's unmerited favor of some sort or a gift, right? 
But then we see Paul talks in first Corinthians chapter 10 about how, uh, his, uh, God's grace was made perfect in his weakness for his power was made, uh, perfect, uh, in his weakness, which I'm pretty sure I just said that twice. So sorry. Um, but my point in saying that is to say he was correlating his grace as his power. He was referring to his grace or correlating it to his power itself. And we don't see any sort of definition in the Bible of power as the concept, but in an outline of biblical usage, you would more likely see that because again, it's how it's actually explained. He says your grace, which is your power. Um, I mean, he's giving his own definition of the word grace right there, regardless of what James Strong says. This is obviously what Paul meant in that time since he literally defined it himself. Um, or, oh, well, okay. Another great example would be, I use the word love, which I would still stand by what I said, but first Corinthians 13, Paul gives a more poetic definition of the word love, specifically the word agape, right? Uh, and he, he shows really what the, uh, not even an exhaustive list, but a more exhaustive list of what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not keep record of wrong. Uh, it seeks the best, right? Et cetera. So he's giving a pretty in-depth explanation of what love is or what love does, which I think is really fruitful for us to consider on our end, because if we can see love is doing the same thing in our lives, it's like, oh, well, am I, am I being patient right now? Am I being kind right now? Am I keeping record of wrong? Oh, that I'm not loving. It just gives you a more great pregnant definition of the word. So anyways, blessed and happy are the first two I'm going to do. Uh, excuse me. Happy is the first one that I'm going to do because the word is blessed. So I'm not going to do the word again. And then I'm going to go down to the Strong's Concordance definition, which is right here. A prolonged uh, uh, form of poetical, um, this, I'm not used to seeing something like that, um, but it means supremely blessed by extension, fortunate, well off, fortunate, well off and happy. So let me go back here. Let's do fortunate, well off and happy. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, so first off, a little bit about going through Strong's and coordinates like this. I'm not allowed to just say, oh, I like happy the best. So we're going to just use happy in this moment. That's, that's not how this works. Uh, you know, most of the time it's going to mean the same thing. But when it doesn't, uh, the, the point is that the context is really important, right? So it's going to help me know which of these words is most relevant by reading the rest of the passage here, right? Now I can tell you that it's going to be more like uh, fortunate or well off, are you? Not necessarily happy. I don't think happy is going to be a very good definition because happier when you are poor in spirit, happier are you uh, when, you know, people say all sorts of evil about you or persecute you. Um, no, you're not happy in those moments. Uh, happy is a, a more of a temporal how I'm feeling right now. And nobody would say they're, they're happy in a moment like that. So I don't think that's going to be the most fruitful uh, uh, definition of that word or what Jesus was intending with that word here. So blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom is theirs. The next thing I want to know is what does poor in spirit mean? Right. So again, what am I going to do? I can either go to the Greeks, uh, but I'm already, again, aware from looking at myself, you're going to get the word poor as in what you would assume poor means spirit as in what you probably already understand the spirit to mean. So this phrase poor in spirit must mean something. So let's go to uh, the got questions again. What does poor in spirit mean? Got questions. I bet they'll have a nice answer for me. And then another thing I, I do as well, especially for things that I don't understand or that are new to me, is I will then rewrite it or summarize it in my own words. I don't see a whole lot of benefit in you quoting a verse um, directly, like, you know, literally just rewriting it down. Um, but I do see a lot of benefit in you rephrasing it or summarizing it, because if you can summarize something, it shows that you can explain it to somebody else well, right? And I want to be able to know something not well enough that I, I kind of get the gist of it, but that I can explain it really, really well on my own to somebody else, right? That's really what I want to do. And uh, through doing a summarization, again, for me personally, it helps me do that. My wife hates it. So uh, it's not like, again, you have to do that. But for me, it works best for me that way. So there's this whole passage right here. I'm not going to copy and paste this whole thing. I just want to give my understanding of this from reading this. So it says, in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declared, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom, uh, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What exactly does it mean to be poor in spirit? And why is being poor in spirit a result uh, uh, in the kingdom of God or heaven, excuse me? Why is poor in spirit something that God wants us to be? Why should we, or why would God want us to be poor uh, at anything, right? Uh, so again, it's it's structuring this question in a very inductive study method kind of way. It's saying like, hey, what does it say? What does it mean? And why is this relevant to me? Some propose that Jesus is speaking of financial poverty, that he is advocating for being poor so that your rich possessions don't come between you and God. While it is true that Jesus elsewhere warned us against the riches, it does not seem to be what Jesus is pointing to uh, when he speaks of being poor in spirit. 
I would agree. It's, I'm sure that that's not what he's referring to. Being spiritually poor in the Beatitudes, Jesus is concerned with spiritual realities, not materialistic possessions. What then does it mean to be spiritually poor? To be spiritually poor is to recognize your utter spiritual bankruptcy before God. It is understanding that you have absolutely nothing worth uh, of worth to offer God. Being poor in spirit is admitting that being uh, of your sin, that you are completely destitute and spiritually can do nothing to deliver yourself from your dire situation. Jesus is saying that no matter what your status is in life, you must recognize your spiritual poverty before you come to God in faith to receive salvation that he offers. Beautiful explanation by them. So now I'm going to say poor... Um, I'm going to say, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? God wants us to recognize, uh, recognize our desperate lack and need for him. Right? So that's what I'm going to put for that. And again, I'm not going to do any more. I could go really, really in depth. And again, sometimes I do. If I feel like there's a need to do that, I will. Um, so what would I say if I were to go on? I would type out what I'm about to audibly say. I would then say there are many proud people and people who think that they've got everything together and don't recognize their need for a savior because they don't see their sins as that bad. Therefore, God recognizes, like it says in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3, that if we can't recognize our own faults, if we can't become foolish in this world, then we will never have real wisdom that it's not the fool or that God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That those who are haughty and proud and arrogant in mind, that those people are going to be knocked down on their butt. But we are, as Christians, called to have humility and come to Christ uh, in a space of reverence, if we want to be able to ever receive him in the first place and stay in that place, all of our Christian walk so that we don't get knocked off our high horse later. I would say something along those lines, right? So obviously if I said all that, that would be like a massive paragraph. I will do that at times. It really just depends for me uh, on like generally if, if it's something that's like really striking me in that moment or not. Um, for this, this is something that I've been, I've talked about a lot. So just for this, for where I'm at right now in my walk, I would just have not done that. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted, right? Um, also what I would do before I went on to verse four is say, what is the kingdom of heaven? There's a kingdom of God and a kingdom of heaven. Are they the same thing? Are they different things? Why does it specifically say the kingdom of heaven here and not the kingdom of God? Um, again, really important things. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Cause again, I just want you to get how I'm going to be doing this versus all the answers. You can study them on your own. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Uh, again, I'd like to know what the word mourn means specifically and what the word comforted means. If I ask you what comforted means, uh, mourn is probably going to be pretty much what you think. You know, uh, this like really, really, you know, desperate weeping kind of space. But what does comforted mean? Does that mean I'm going to get the cuddly wuddlies? Does that mean I'm going to get goosebumps and the feely wheely? Like, what does it actually mean? So I want to know. And I actually just looked it up the other day, so I do know. Uh, but it's really interesting. I will tell you that the word comfort is not what you think the word comfort means. Um, a slap on the back or a push, um, you know, towards something is a lot of what comfort is. Um, not always just a hug. It can be a hug as well, but it's not always that. Blessed are the gentle for they will inherit the earth. Um, words like this, man, are really important for you to look up because gentle, again, if I ask you, I think this is one of the most challenging words to define in the entire Bible, by the way, the word gentle. Because if I say, what does it mean to be gentle? Does it mean to be soft spoken? Well, that can't be because Jesus was, seemed evidently not soft spoken in a lot of scenarios, right? Uh, like, you know, Matthew 5 and the Sermon on Mount here. He's probably yelling what he's saying. Like, just so that people can hear him, he's yelling. He's not mad, but he's just yelling so that people can hear. Well, so that can't be gentle. Does gentle mean not hurting somebody? Well, I think that's probably pretty obvious. Does that actually mean gentle, though? This is a really interesting word in the Bible. So I would go into that in a deep dive on that word right now. Because, um, again, it's very interesting. What do you mean inherit the earth? I thought I was already on the earth. So why would I inherit the earth if I'm already here? I wouldn't look that up. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied um, you know, again, I'd probably want to know what it, the word righteousness means. Cause again, if I ask you for a lot of these things, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What next? But it's like, no, can you actually define the word righteousness? What does Jesus mean when he says righteousness right now? Does he mean live in moral perfection? Like, what does he actually mean? So again, I'd want to know those six and the blessed, you can go through all those. Those ones are pretty easy, like an elementary one to do. Cause again, it's like peacemaker and then the thing, right? So it's like, blessed are those who fill in the blank for they blank. So you can look up both of those things. Those ones are pretty easy. But then it gets more interesting when we get down here, right? Uh, blessed are those, uh, or, or you are the salt of the earth. Okay, weird. 
But if the salt has become tasteless, how then can it become salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot, right? He, he is starting this sermon. Like, I want you to really think of the context of this, that what he's doing right now. He comes up, he says this short po- poetic, you know, phrase, and then he just goes into being like, yo, you, y'all need to be salty. Like, that seem, might seem off or strange to you. It would have to them too. Uh, for slightly different reasons, but that would have seemed strange to them. Like he's not going into a normal three point sermon. Like he didn't open up the scroll of Isaiah. He didn't go through Jeremiah just now. He is speaking entirely new things to these people, which is really profound. And I want to know why, right? What, what is salt? What is the emphasis on salt? You seem to think this is a big deal. You are the light of the world. Again, what is this light of the world reference to, right? Uh, well, obviously these Jews who are listening to him speak right now would have understood that this has some correlation to the Genesis story of God creating uh, light. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Uh, again, another reference to uh, the creation story. Uh, the Garden of Eden was on a hill. It was on a mountain. Um, so again, this would have been another thing. And, and obviously the Garden of Eden would have stood out from everything else because it's where perfection was and where God dwelled. Uh, nor do people light up a lamp and put it under a basket but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. So your light must shine before men so that they might see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. Okay. Again, like what does that actually look like? I want to know how do I actually let my light so shine before men? It sounds really great. It sounds really churchy, but back to the inductive study method thing again, like how does this apply to my life? How can I actually let my light shine? Right. It has nothing to do with the flashlight on your phone, obviously. So what does he mean? What does let your light so shine mean? Well, again, if you don't know, I would Google it, but you want to be able to give answers to these questions in a way that can explain to somebody the exact, like give them exact examples or an exact generality on what this means. If you can't give that to me and all you can say is, well, it just means like, you know, like, 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 you know, let your light shine. That is not good enough for somebody else to be able to understand or you to even be able to understand, right? I want to understand well enough to teach to somebody, not just so that I can like kind of get the vibe myself. So like when I listen to that, I'm like, let my light so shine before man so I can see my good works and glorify my father. Well, a light is obviously seen. It's very evidently seen. If you're in a dark room, like I'm in a pitch black room right now with the exception of a neon light behind me, the LED strips over there and the box light in front of me. If it wasn't for those, it'd be pitch black, right? So that light does a whole lot. Uh, this light on my face lets you see how bright I am right now. And the lights behind me, uh, you can see right here as it, it illuminates my back to show the dimension from the back of the room. The point is, is like these lights are doing a significant amount in this room right now. And we should have a significant, a significant black and white, blatant darkness to light impact on how people see what we do and they give glory to God because of what they're seeing in our lives. So again, what does that applicably look like? Well, it says so they can see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. So by letting your light shine, it means it's, he's equating it here or correlating here with good works. Okay. So what are some good works? I can give me a handful of good works that you can do to let other people see your light shine so that they can glorify your father in heaven. Well, we can feed the homeless. We can uh, uh, serve in a church, obviously. That would be like on the bottom of my list, but you can do that as well. Uh, You can preach the gospel to people like we're commanded to. We can serve the household of the faith uh, like we're commanded to and serve those people. We can disciple people who are in need. These are a handful of things that we can do that are good works that other people can see and glorify God in heaven. We can give financially to things. Other people can see these things and give glory to God. If the point is to give glory to you, you've missed the mark. But I want to be able to do this in such a way that people can see it and give glory to God. Romans 12 correlates this or or is relevant on the same point where it talks about how uh, other people should be able to see our good deeds, our hospitality, so that they can see where our heart really is. We want uh, people to see, not for our sake, not to boast or brag, but for people to be encouraged in being able to see what they can do as well or where we are from in the first place, which again, in this case is God. So again, if you can't explain those things and articulate those things properly, uh, then you don't know it well enough. And then it says, do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fill For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest stroke or letter may pass from the law until it is accomplished. This is one of the most misquoted verses in the entire Bible. Um, people often say that we're supposed to live by the old covenant law today because Jesus just said that we're not supposed to abolish it. That is not what it said. It said we're not supposed to abolish it until it is accomplished. When Jesus died on the cross, he said it is finished. Italistai, meaning that the law had been fully accomplished because Jesus lived by it perfectly. Now, again, if I did not know that, I would have had to look that up. Therefore, whoever nullifies the least of these commandments or teaches others to do the same shall be the least in the kingdom of heaven. One thing that strikes out to me here is, does that mean that they will be in heaven, but they'll just be the least? Or does that mean that heaven will know them as some of the least people? 
something important to look up. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For I say, unless your righteousness surpasses those of the scribes of the fact, those of the scribes and the Pharisees, excuse me, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So then I'd be like, whoa, okay, so what were the scribes and Pharisees like? What was the standard that they lived by? And am I actually living better than them or not? Again, real applicable. So I would go to all the passages. Again, I would use open Bible. Look at this. We're going to use all of our tools here. Um, so we're going to do Pharisees. Pharisees. What does the Bible say about Pharisees? I want to look up every single one of these verses. And if you're reading, you're going to see a, a bit of a pattern in certain passages or chapters where it talks about these Pharisees. Uh, I'll just give you a, a easy clue right here. I just know from reading my Bible every day from seven years that Matthew 23 is going to be the woe to the Pharisees. I think that's like Luke somewhere. I forget where it goes through a different woe uh, to the Pharisees and he rips into them. So if you want a good context of how you look versus how the Pharisees look and see if you think you'll go to heaven based upon how Jesus condemns the Pharisees. That'd be a good place to go. Matthew 25 and Luke, again, wherever it is. I forget exactly where it is. So I'm not going to guess. But um, that would be another great example of another place that you can go to find out how that is. But again, do you see how I'm just finding different things here uh, that are, again, very important? Uh, I mean, the whole sermon on the Matt, you could take years to just go through this whole you know section itself. But really, really important topics here that uh, are not worth you just jumping over. Like, again, after I've explained this about this whole thing with the Pharisees, like, think about this for a second. You could maybe not go to heaven. You might spend eternity apart from Jesus because you might not be living greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, which if we can remember is what Jesus just gave the standard of as in what it looks like to or to not go to heaven. For unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are bold words. I would be terrified right now if I didn't know how the scribes and Pharisees live because I'm like, there's a chance that I could be lower than them right now. And reading, hopefully you figure out that you're not. Um, but that's important. Like, like we shouldn't just read over that and go to the next verse. And that's what so many people do because they either don't understand or they don't even know what a Pharisee or Sadducee is, right? I remember, I think I told said this earlier in the video, but I remember uh, in my first months of being a Christian looking up the word Pharisee because I'm like, uh, you know, I, I looked around. I was like, man, everybody else is talking about Pharisees and Sadducees or reading over these passages and like no one's batting an eye at it. And I remember this. This is one of the most pivotal moments of my Christian faith. I remember asking somebody, what is a Pharisee? And it was a leader at our church. He was paid staff at our church. And he was like, yeah, so you know how like back in that day, how like there was like a, like, you know how, you just knew how it was with like the religious leaders and stuff like that. I was like, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. And then he like retried to fumble through it. And you could just tell that he didn't know what it was either. I was like, wow, this dude does not know what a Pharisee is or a Sadducee, obviously. So I'd ask a few more people who were uh, in leadership, not paid staff, but leadership at the church. And all of them gave me the same weak runaround answer. And I was like, oh my gosh, nobody here knows what this means. I don't even know if the pastor knows what it means. And it gave me the realization that people are just spewing out this stuff and acting like they know what they're talking about. And they don't know what they're talking about. But they're just saying it simply out of what? Out of trying to seem smart, out of trying to fit in with the crowd. But in all reality, none of them knew what it meant. So when I learned what it meant, I would start really defining these words in a third grade level to every single person that I was around because I knew you didn't have to say, I just knew statistically speaking, you probably didn't know what this word meant either because I just learned it last week. You know what I mean? So now when I talk about these things, I oftentimes will, will define these words or concepts that we're talking about because if not, nobody else is going to do it to you and everyone's going to assume that you know, but nobody knows. It's like the most ironic paradox ever. And I don't want to be one of those people who talks about people's heads because I'm just super spiritual or something like that. Um, or just not even know what I'm talking about myself. So that's why it's really important to not, like jump over these things. Because by the time I was in like Matthew 7, like Pharisees have been mentioned like over a dozen times. And I was like, okay, I need to figure out who these dudes are because like Jesus is calling straight shots to these people. I don't go to heaven if I'm not greater than these people. And Jesus really doesn't seem to have a good taste in his mouth from them, nor does John the Baptist. So like, I better figure out who these dudes are. Like what was their actual role and whatnot? And once I found out, I was like, oh my gosh, it led me to so many more questions, which led me to so many more rabbit holes to learn so much more about Jesus and his heart and character is really, really good. But do you see how we're going through this? And, you know, mind you right now, I'm in, I'm in, you know, what is this? 11 point font. And uh, this is all single space. And you can see how much of a page uh, with no, like, you know, indentions or, you know, no, you know, double lettering or double spacing or anything that I'm at. You can see how much room I've already taken up on this page and I've done two verses. What's going to happen when I do 10 verses, right? I mean, we're going to have pages of notes by the time that I'm done with 10 verses, right? And what is this? A quarter of the page right here. 
I, I think that I'm like, like, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe a, maybe a fifth of the page. I mean, guys, I, like when you start really doing this stuff, you're going to see how much you're learning from this. And then at the end of the chapters, again, just something I like to do is give a quick summary, quick overview of this. Right. And the other thing, as I'd mentioned before that I would do is when I'm going to start reading it, I'm going to go to the Bible project and I'm going to want to know, Hey, what is the book of uh, Matthew about? And hopefully it's going to help me. And I'll tell you from watching it, it will help you. So you get to watch this video and it's going to be super informative, super helpful for you. And it's going to give you the right frame of mind when you go through reading it. So anyways, what does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply to my life? Giving those answers and then summarizing the passages that you're going through is going to be really, really beneficial. I so appreciate any of you who have stayed this far with me. If you could subscribe so that other people can just see this video, because that's how the YouTube algorithm works. And we want as many people to be able to understand and fully break down the Bible as possible. If you have any other topics you want us to go over, throw those in the comments. We would love to be able to answer those in deep dives as well. We're not as big on the whole three, four, five minute videos. We would rather go super in depth with every one of the videos that we make. And if you want to go into your next deep dive video from us, click this video right over here.